Hi, ladies and gentlemen, we are currently live on YouTube. I just wanted everybody who is on this call to be aware. We're going to give just a few more minutes uh, for members to sign on. Um, we will absolutely be starting uh, by around 2.05. If you can just hang in for a minute, we'll be right with you. Thanks. Hello. Hi, Madam Chair. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and uh, looking forward to uh, listening to all the concerns people have about our bills. And uh, I will be in and out in case there's a situation, but I will be listening. And uh, if I miss anything, I'll go back and listen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Poter, you are phenomenal. You're here in hero mode. I love it. Thank you so much for the work that you do. I just, you know, even before we convene the meeting, I just want to let you know, um, I think you're amazing. I've said it a thousand times. I'll say it a thousand more. I love the fact that you are working to save lives there and then working to change lives here. Um, you're just fantastic and amazing. Come in and out as you see fit. Um, we appreciate you and everything you do. And I'm sure I can get a bunch of seconds out of that. So thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Very thank you. Absolutely second that. <laughs> yep. And we will we'll convene the meeting in just about uh, two more minutes. Okay, it looks like a lot of our members have arrived. So uh, I'd like to convene the public hearing of the Committee on Children on Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. We are live uh, in Zoom and YouTube for all members, uh, just to be aware. Meetings will be conducted at a slower pace to accommodate the quality of the live stream. Again, this always deserves the joke that that is much to um, Rep Boyd's chagrin. All participants will be muted until required to speak. Members must raise their virtual hand to signify a desire to speak and wait to be recognized. Do so, open the participant pane and click raise hand at the bottom of the panel. The use of emoticons as in clapping hands or thumbs up is not allowed. And the use of chat, either public or private is not allowed. All chat records are saved by default and therefore could be subjected to FOIA requests. Um, welcome to the meeting, everybody. I'm Representative Liz Linehan, the co-chair of the Committee on Children and the House Chair. I represent Chester Southington in Wallingford. Uh, this is my second term as chair. We also have um, my fantastic co-chair, Senator Anwar. I know that he is here and listening. I'm not sure, oh, there he is. Hello, Senator Anwar. Hello, Wanted everyone. to say a couple more words? Yeah, well, thank you, everyone. Looking forward to listening to the testimonies and uh, I am just covering the ICUs. I just step out and if I have to uh, leave for a second, I will uh, catch up immediately uh, and, and make sure that uh, I'm up to date with uh, whatever people's concerns and thoughts, uh, support or lack of on any bill is. Thank you again, Madam Chair.
Fantastic. Thank you. And, and again, I said this um, prior to convening the meeting, but I'll say it again. It's absolutely amazing uh, to have Senator Anwar as my co-chair. Um, the man is currently saving lives in the hospital uh, and still part of this meeting. And then um, he's working here to change lives of children for the better. So um, I always give him a round of applause. I just I think I'm the luckiest co-chair on the planet to uh, work with him. Uh, with that, I'm going to go to my um, ranking members. Representative Daphne, say hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Ready to get started. Excellent. Thank you so much, Senator Martin. I am uh, good to go. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. And with that, we can um, call our first person. And just a quick reminder. We do do the first hour um, testimony is reserved for public officials. And after the first hour, we flip back and forth. Um, I do have to apologize for my screen that you can, the sun is not working. Oh, there we go. The sun was not working with me for a while. Um, we'll do our best to be seen. Uh, but now I'd like to ask Representative Gupil to join us. Representative, are you here? Hi. Um... Good afternoon, Senator Anwar, Representative Lenahan, and members of the Children's Committee. Um, I just want to thank you very much for supporting this concept of raising House Bill 5698, um, an act concerning, sorry, that's the wind <laughs> blowing in my windows, an act concerning the uh, collection and reporting of adverse childhood um, experience data as a committee bill. Um, I just want to let you know, uh, this is not my field of expertise by any means. Um, I really come from the, um, the project development area, planning and development area, and I was the former first selectman of the town of Clinton. But um, the reason I, I did raise this bill was I had been hearing from a number of advocacy groups, um, listening to calls and discussing how to change outcomes of um, the children's in our, children in our state that... Um, they were lacking the necessary information to advocate for the resources that they needed. And they needed a more comprehensive system to, um, to provide the data back to the state and to advocate for that. Um, and then also just capturing the data, um, just the inconsistencies that we've seen with that information. And then the lack of avail availability of the preschool information before kids make it to the public school setting. Um, you know, some of the inconsistencies are both, you know, the way we model it and then again, the agencies that we capture it from. Uh, we have state agencies, sometimes the school districts are collecting all the comprehensive data, but sometimes they're not. Um, you have health districts sometimes that collect data and then you also have health directors in the local municipalities. And sometimes as well as law enforcement are aware of some of the, um, the issues surrounding the impacts on children. Um, so, you know, again, this not being my field of expertise, um, I just looked at it from the long view, um, being a project manager and saying, all right, if, how are we going to get there the long term, making sure that the children, once they leave that setting, that high school setting, which is, you know, a protective environment and become adults and move out to the, the real world, um, that they've been provided as much of the resources that they need to become su successful adults. And in order to do that is looking at the data and making sure that the data can point to where the resources need to be directed. Um, you know, in our community I, as well, we have the juvenile review boards, which are a very successful program in a lot of the communities. But again, making sure that, again, the kids who end up in that system have been provided the, um, the resources that they need. Um, I just want to, you know, acknowledge a number of the different organizations who are going to be submitting their testimony today. Some of them are able to um, testify, but I think most of the testimony will be submitted um, through written statements. And um, I think ultimately they're looking to, to strengthen the resources for the vulnerable and close the, the gap uh, through early intervention through some consistent, reliable data. Um, they're also looking at the best practices out of legislation in California specific to ACEs as well, which um, is, is going to be very interesting and in watching how that unfolds. Um, testimony and support from these agencies, um, make sure we need to look at some of the privacy um, requirements incorporated into this legislation now. So that's been raised by a number of different organizations who I've spoke to as well. I know Rep Wielander and Rep Belinda have as well. Um, so we need to just make sure that that's clarified. 
Um, and one other concept that was just discussed with one of the groups was this, there's potential to expand this into some sort of training for coaches and youth groups and educators so that they can also have an eye to looking for what is needed within the community and for children as well. Um, so again, uh, we have Paul Dorkin, he's the um, executive vice president of the community child health and he's also a, uh, a um, physician. Uh, Kimberly Martini Car Carvel, Executive Director of Help Me Grow National Center at Children, Connecticut's Children Medical Center, have provided testimony. Um, Aline Keyes, uh, Connecticut Children with Incarcerated Parents and Initiatives, will, she'll provide some testimony as to some of the areas where she just wants to make sure that we have it tightened to um, protect some of the children and the families, as well as Lee's Andrews of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, so again, I, I very much thank you for your time and I really appreciate the, the committee taking up this legislation and recognizing the importance of it. Um, and I thank you for all the work you're doing because I know it's a very emotional committee to sit on. So thank you. Thank you very much, Representative. We really appreciate you being here and we appreciate you for putting forth this legislation. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of people here on this committee and myself included who aren't um, completely aware of how ACES data is used. And so right now I wanna be very clear that the legislation we have before us, um, we are very much looking forward to the testimony from uh, those groups that you named. Um, however, most of them are going to be um, uh, written testimony and they're not on the list to speak today. So I would like to remind all of my committee members to take a look at the written testimony. I think what's gonna to have to happen is we are most likely um, going to be answering questions along the way. Uh, and certainly um, if the bill moves forward, it will most likely be with some substitute language. So um, it's going to really be one of those all hands on deck to get this to um, really be able to um, achieve the end results that you representative are looking for within that problem that you recognized. And, uh, so thank you very much for that. Are there any questions for the representative? Uh, Rep Dauphine. Thank you, um, Representative Linehan, and thank you, um, Representative, for your testimony. Um, I'm just interested, so is this going to be um, something new done, or I'm, I'm trying to look through the bill now, or is this a, a new concept? Um, that you're that you're wanting to see this data calculated from, or is this something that you're building on? Um, and I, I will also look for the committee members to just solidify what my statements are. Again, I'm not an expert in this field, but my understanding and my conversations with folks along the lines is that we currently do accumulate this data, but it's not in a consistent methodology right now. And so because of that, we are not able to um, provide the resources back to the organizations, the schools, wherever it really needs to be directed to support um, the children who have been recognized with specific um, adverse impacts. So, so you're trying to make it more efficient and more user-friendly, user is that what it is? Correct. And another question, you talk, you did mention um, something about privacy and you weren't sure about that because I noticed here it said um, school disciplinary records um, such as data relating to suspensions, expulsions, and disciplinary actions. Um, is it your, um, your, your, your desire to make, to keep this anonymous? Again, I'm going to look to a little bit more from the agencies who um, handle the data and then the schools in terms of making sure that just the children are protected um, in terms of the experiences that they have encountered. Um, we certainly wouldn't want any of that to become public information just by the need of accumulating the data. So um, again, I'm going to look for the experts to make sure that the systems that are in place are accurate within the legislation to protect them. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. Madam Chair. You're very welcome. Representative Foster. Hi, Representative Gupil. Thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm really glad that you raised this topic for us today to discuss. Um, I was wondering, um, I think for the benefit of sort of laying the ground for this conversation, since you're first on the agenda, 
Can you talk a little bit about the organizations who might use this data? What kinds of things aren't available to them and with better data, what they're going to do? And I know this is something that you're eager and passionate about. I know it's not in your realm of expertise, but you're selling yourself a little bit short since you've been a CEO of a town. But um, but can you um, can you tell us a little bit about what you think could be done with this data if it was improved and it's better and more accessible for people to use an interface? Hey, I think sometimes when you talk about it um, from the town's perspectives um, and you're looking at outcomes of children leaving the public school system, um, we've had a lot of the communities who have had um, suicides. Um, you know, obviously we've got a severe opioid epidemic taking place. Some of this, I'm, I'm hoping that this type of data ultimately will help support children at a much earlier age that we can target them and we're able to um, provide them with the resources that potentially they won't end up on the other side of um, any of these out, you know, these, these horrible outcomes that we see in our communities. Um, you know, just in the past couple of years with, with what's happening just with, or, or moving forward, what's gonna happen with um, the pandemic and um, the fact that our police departments are recognizing such a severe um, increase in domestic violence in the households as well, and making sure that we're able to capture that information and then provide the resources back to the families, back to the children um, through a, a, a consistent methodology and resources being, you know, it can be the, the financial resources, the social services resources. Most of the towns have a human services department that do have clinical um, uh, staff that are able to provide um, um, therapies as well. So I, you know, I, I, I kind of see it as a, a very robust um, system, um, but you know, making sure that we have the correct data so that every community is provided the right amount of resource and as opposed to sort of guessing mm, five years down the line, will we need that? Will we need to build out our systems to address it or not? And I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think what I'm hearing you say is that this allows us an opportunity to sort of get a lay of the land and sort of perform a community needs assessment so that if there are necessary municipal or state interventions, funding that needs to be reallocated or um, even if the grassroots um, nonprofit organizations that we partner with need to reallocate their resources or change what they're doing, they need comprehensive strategically collected data so that they can make sure that their resources are being appropriately allocated. Um, and it sounds like the, a lot of that data exists that your proposal for in this is to make sure that it's in a way that can be interfaced by multiple stakeholders and the product is deliverable. So thank you so much for bringing this important issue to our attention. Thank Thanks you. For coming. Thank you so much, Rep Foster. Uh, Senator Martin, you had your hand up um, and I don't see it again. Is I, I did and uh, Representative Foster's question answered my question. Thank you. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and seeing uh, no more qu questions, Representative Goupil, thank you very much for being here and thank you for this bill. Thank you. I do appreciate it. And I apologize. I can't stick around to hear if there's further testimony. I have to head back over to planning and development. But we'll send you, you a note. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say um, very quickly, I forgot to mention before um, that we do have a three minute rule on testimony um, and our assistant clerk, Jamal, will unmute himself and politely inform you that your time has finished. We do want to recognize that he has probably one of the most difficult and uncomfortable jobs here in the legislature. So if people could just be on the lookout or keep your ear out for him, he is just trying to keep things moving along and we very, very much appreciate what he does. Um, next, we have Representative Howard. Hi, Representative Howard, how are you? Good afternoon, Representative Lennie, and how are you? I'm hanging in. What do you got for us today? Well, I set my background appropriately. I hope you all enjoy that. I we love uh, it. Representative Lenihan, Senator Anwar, Senator Martin, Rep. Dauphiné, first and foremost, thank you to you and the members of this committee for raising Bill 6511. As I'm sure you all can imagine, I'm here to testify in favor of that bill. And in the interest of all of your time, having heard from me on a very similar concept in the very recent past, I'm going to uh, keep my comments brief, uh, except to say that I did do a bit more uh, work and, and I am in support of the bill. But there, there is um, a background check standard for that the United States Olympic and Paralympic, Paralympic Committee 
uh, uses as well as safe sport. So I will submit to uh, Representative Lenningham for distribution uh, some information about that that I hope you'll consider. And the real purpose of that is to just make sure that we don't have organizations within our state that are duplicating their efforts uh, just to meet that standard as well as our state standard when in, when in effect they're getting the same information and just costing them twice as much. So I uh, certainly don't want to, to put uh, unnecessary costs on any organization. Um, but with that, I just, you know, having raised this concept and feel so strongly about the bill, I did want to be here today just in case there was any follow-up questions to my previous testimony uh, as to how important this is and uh, just with my background in, in conducting background checks and running the organization that I do. Um, but, I, but I do encourage you to take a look at that. I, I tell my ball players that um, it's an interesting thing that experience is, um, or good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from poor judgment. So if you can rely on other people's experience, you can kind of skip the poor judgment part. And I, I uh, offer that to, to my, my uh, ball players and I try to take that advice myself. So if we can see what those uh, organizations are doing at the federal standard, we can uh, hopefully skip the uh, any mistakes part. So with that, I'll take uh, any questions. Thank you so very much, Representative. I will say you are just quickly becoming one of my favorite representatives <laughs> in the legislature. <laughs> I mean, we seem to really have a lot, of, a lot in common here on what we're trying to accomplish. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I know that I know those questions that you have because I have those questions as well. So um, let's back up and let me ask you some questions actually as a coach because you mentioned safe sport. What I am aware regarding safe sport is there's a lot of training involved with safe sport, correct? Sure. Right. And as a coach, have you taken the safe sport training? Not safe sport, a similar training, but not exactly that, but the same basic concept. All right, so let's let's break it down for a minute. You take this training and it teaches you, among other things, the proper way to handle yourself around a child, the do's mm -hmm. and the don'ts, correct? Mm -hmm. We're correct. But with your background, can you tell me, do you think that taking a safe sport training, if someone is becoming a coach in order to abuse a child, is that safe sport training going to stop them from abusing a child? Well, it's not going to stop an abuser. No. I mean, what it was designed to do is help other coach recognize that, you know, that's part of it right. too. So, um, sorry, but, uh, so, and to that end, you know, we could talk about this in a broad spectrum. There's, there's training to check a box and there's, there's training to get tools to do a job better. Okay. And when somebody signs up to be a volunteer coach, say in my organization, they're not signing up to, to, to do that, to, to do that, to make those recognitions and go and report it and those types of things. That sort of relies on me as, as the administrator to take those hard lines. And it's, and I, I told you guys previously at this committee that it's, it's no fun. It's no fun kicking a coach off a sideline and say, your, your, your style is not keeping my program. Have a good day. You can leave now. Um, you know, it's, I don't like to do that, you know, because the biggest thing that, that concerns me is, you know, those types of coaches are generally parents. And if they take their child, you know, you're in effect hurting that kid. And, and that makes it difficult. So, so the notion that, that you're going to have that training and put people in that position, they're going to take on that responsibility. Um, uh, I worry about the reliability of that. And you're aware um, of uh, the recent news story where the um, USA Gymnastics coach was um, charged with multiple counts of child sex abuse and, and child sex trafficking and died by suicide. Um, and so, you know, when we look at the Olympic guidelines and Paralympic guidelines, we are assuming, of course, that they are um, coming out of the recent um, problems and scandals. I hate to use the word scandal because it sounds more like from, from the National Enquirer rather than a real absolute problem, but it is a, it is a real absolute problem. Um, and so those were born out of these issues, but um, have you seen uh, exactly what is required and then compare them to what we're requiring in this bill? I have, and in essence, what, what I talked about with the third party system that I use, it's in essence the same thing. Uh, they just detail it a little bit more specifically, uh, but to, to your point, Representative, on, uh, on the Olympics, the Paralympic background checks that they do now, brings home the point I just said, they're now exercising good judgment because of their experience that they got from bad judgment, right? So right. 
So they had the problem that they had, they, and they sought to fix it and, and they're doing that. So, you know, hopefully that right. moves in the continued good so, direction. Representative, you were um, with us in the General Assembly when we tried to move forward concussion legislation. Um, and I am sure as um, a coach and an administrator, you understand how important um, concussion education is. Uh, sure. But we had a group of parents saying, if we impose more training, um, then we're going to have less people to who are willing to coach. Um, and do you feel that if we um, institute stronger background checks that that will be the same here? Um, I, I don't think that, let me answer your question the way I think you asked it. First of all, let me say to you that my conference doesn't allow more than five coaches on a sideline. And every one of my team has more than five coaches and every one of my coaches is required to take the heads up um, mm -hmm. training that, that I think you're referencing. So I have not seen a dip at all. Um, in fact, we, we exceed the, the number. We have to have coaches in the press box and in other places. Um, I do not think that a coach, uh, an individual who wants to come out and coach will be deterred by this. And I have had conversations with folks. I think if, you know, we, we touched on this last time, if you went to a fingerprint supported background check where they have to make appointments and it's costly and those types of things, you might, maybe you'd see a dip. But as it sits now, you know, these sort of background checks is as simple as send an email, you get it, you put in your information, send it back, you could do it, you know, waiting for the bus. Uh, so no, I don't anticipate that there'll be a dip at all. Great, thank you so much. And then one last question for you before we move on. Um, I, uh, some of the representatives who um, signed on to co-sponsor this legislation over the weekend were contacted by an organization um, who I'm assuming you were also contacted by um, that says that they, um, it is their job to do these background checks and they advertise that they do these background checks um, and they're the Olympic background checks, they're the, the stronger ones, um, and that they advertise that they do these for, um, for sports organizations around the country. Um, did you also get that information? Yes, I, I spoke with, I, I, I believe I spoke with those same folks. Right. Here's my concern about that. And I hope that they're testifying today. Um, a quick glance, I don't see them on here, um, but I do hope that they somehow um, are on and, and we don't have um, their organization name on the list. But my concern is, is that even though they're a nonprofit, they are doing these background checks for money. That is a revenue stream for them and they are bringing them in. And, my, and I submit this to everyone on the committee as, as well as to you. Um, that we currently have no background checks. And so um, to provide background checks in the manner that we are looking to do so for camps, um, that really does not require third party, but they can use third party, would, would mean that an organization wouldn't have to spend a great deal of money in order to do that. In fact, I wonder if there's any cost associated with it at all, if we're just use, utilizing state departments. But I just want to make it very clear that this committee will be looking at what um, the uh, uh, Olympic guidelines are, the USOC guidelines. However, if these, if we are asked to put into statute something that simply this is the only nonprofit organization that can provide that, this, this won't happen. We, I won't put that through. The Children's Committee is the committee that looked over the health, welfare, and safety of children. And um, we are not someone who puts into statute something for the betterment or the revenue stream of any individual company, organization, or nonprofit. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And in fact, if I could, I just want to make sure that, that I was clear that when I referenced USOPC, um, it, it was just to make sure that we're not making any of those organizations uh, duplicate their efforts that are already complying with that. I certainly would advocate, in fact, I would agree with you, Representative, that as a, the president of Stonington Youth Football, I should be afforded the opportunity to, to shop around for the best price that I can to get my background checks done, provided those background checks meet the standard. Um, and, and they're hitting the, the correct databases. And that's what I'll, I'll be happy to provide to you what, what I think those databases should be. I'm not sure that you would get all of those through the state without a charge, though. I think there may be um, 
I'm not sure of a way to do that. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you'd have to pay somebody somewhere to get that information, even if it was to the state. Um, yeah, we'll ask get, about that and make sure right. before we pass the bill. Yeah. That's all information that we flesh out. So okay. um, with that, I'm done with my questioning, but I see that Representative Dauphinese has her hand up. Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative, for being here to testify. Um, I know we asked some of these questions last time, and I just wanted to kind of go over again a few of them. And one thing I did miss asking you last time was we didn't talk about the sex offender list that is in a, there's a registry out that's with sex, sex offenders that have been convicted, correct? That's correct. And so who, who gets put on that list? Depends what state they're in. So every state has a different sort of standard for that. Um, from my own experience very recently, uh, I'll give you an example. In Connecticut, depending on what you're convicted of, uh, you get put on, you know, a 10 year or a lifetime, depending on what it is, but we had, and you have to transfer that, right? So we had an individual here who was on a 10 year, he moved to Texas. When he did, he had to register there. And under Texas law, once you're registered, you're, you're a lifetime. So when he moved back, he got converted to lifetime, which is sort of a convoluted thing in, in, you know, the sovereignty of states, but it all depends on what state you're in and exactly how that works. Cause each state has their own sort of, um, uh, threshold for how you get put on it, if, if that makes sense, <laughs> which it probably doesn't, but that's how it is. Right. So when you have, um, when, when a camp would have uh, volunteers or coaches or, or the like, um, you could access that list to see who was on that list for the state of Connecticut. And um, I know, I know that that list is available even in your own um, area where you live, you can look to see where individuals are living. Is that, is that the case? Yes, and I think it's important also, Representative Dauphine, to note that um, if you get convicted, say, of, of a sexual offense that gets you on a 10-year registry, just because you're off the, the registry in 10 years, your conviction still stays there. So 12 years later, if you come to my program to be a you know coach and I run your background check and see that conviction, I'll still disqualify you. Right. So um, can you speak a little bit more to, we talked about the DCF list last time, and we talked about... Um, how one's name might get on there. And I think I shared with you that I've been told by a couple of attorneys how difficult it is to get your name off of there and how those individuals have no, no due process when they're put on that list. Um, and that's part of the background check that you access, correct? That's correct. So that DCF Center Registry uh, representative, and I share your concern about the manner in which people are put on that without due process. Uh, I'm not sure we necessarily agree on the difficulty by which people come off of that because hundreds of people come off of that each year. Um, at, at least that's what I'm told because I followed up with DCF on that. Um, but certainly, yes, to get on that that list, there there is a limited process, a limited burden of proof, um, and it's almost unilateral with the DCF investigator. So um, I, I share your concern, but again, I, I, I reiterate what I've said previously that your mere presence on that list is not under as, as you have it here, as I understand legislation and certainly the way that we operate here would not, uh, in, in my program, would not automatically disqualify you. We would find out a little bit more about those circumstances from the applicant to determine if they're eligible or not. So that would be specifically how you would handle it, but perhaps not how another camp would handle that list. That's correct. But, I, but again, I, as I said previously as well, you know, my, my program has my name on it. Um, and in each individual program has their name on it. So um, I would just because I, I feel that somebody is on that list and is still eligible um, and not disqualified based on the circumstances for my program, I certainly wouldn't tell somebody else that they need to make a different decision if they feel that that individual is is not adequate for their particular program. And, and again, there's a lot of variables to that. You know, are, are you have a program with a lot of one on one time with a coach and a kid or do you have a program like mine where you know, I generally oversee every practice and game. So I'm kind of watching everything myself. So I have a little bit more leniency because I can keep track of things myself. So, you know, I wouldn't put that on somebody to make the same decision I do. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then um, we talked about the last time with regard to your experience and perhaps how many individuals might have been identified had they had a background check in Connecticut that didn't. And when I asked you, you know, how many, you said that you weren't aware of any. So can you just speak to that a little bit? 
Well, that's true. Um, since since our last uh, time here, I did receive some preliminary information from the Child Advocacy Center uh, telling me that there was at least four that she's uncovered because they don't track data that way where she could set the parameters. At least four where the victim um, identified a coach or similar type adult in their life as the assailant. But I can't tell you how many of them had a previous record that maybe would have prevented it. I don't know if there's any. Yeah. We heard several testimonies last time, and I think, if I recall, none of them had, um, they, they shared that they would not have identified any because, as we all know, many people are out there um, doing things they shouldn't be doing and haven't been caught yet, right? So um, I yes. think, the, yeah, I think that's a big, big, big problem, right? We, we've heard it um, with, in regard uh, to I, I'm, no offense to the priest, but we've heard heard that with regard to the priest um, over and over again on on the news with regard to how many um, children have been molested and they had no record and nobody would have known until finally a child came out. But um, I think that's it. I think we covered most everything last time. I just wanted to thank you again for your testimony today. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. You're welcome, Representative. And just um, to let you know, Representative, that we do have due process throughout the entire um, way of getting people on and off um, the Child Abuse and Neglect Registry, so the Department of Children and Families. Uh, two years ago, we went through that process. Um, and I can dig it out and send it to you, but it, it was literally like there were something like 10, 15 different opportunities by which people can get their names off of that list. Um, so uh, we will get that for you. It's like a handy dandy flow chart um, because I know that there is some belief that you can't get off of that list. And we have numbers that show that there are plenty that are off that list a year. I think Re um, Representative Howard's mentioned hundreds and I believe that is correct. So we'll make sure to get that information to the committee prior to voting on this bill. So I spoke to two attorneys that actually do that. That's their job. And they have highlighted for me how difficult that process is and how lengthy it is. And um, I think, you know, facts will probably speak out, but, but from what they're telling me, it is a very long process and very difficult to get the names off. Okay, well, I, I just submit to you and to the committee that a lengthy process um, for the benefit of children, I think does not equal lack of due process. Uh, but we could talk about that well, um, no, the, lack, the lack of due process was something completely different. I was just talking about remove. There is no due process with that list. They do not go through a trial um, and a due process. So that was something completely different. I'll get you all the information and we could have a discussion offline. Uh, so thank you very much. Representative Foster. Thanks for the opportunity to speak again. Um, Representative Howard and I have had a conversation about this in the past, but I feel like for the benefit of the group, it might be helpful to get this perspective. The DCF registry, there is a chance that someone ends up on the DCF registry while a police invest investigation is happening, right? That they would get on that registry first and faster, correct? Uh, yeah, that's actually, the, the that's pretty common. So, so if I can, if you give me a minute, I... In essence, let's just say, for example, today a child came in and said that they were assaulted by, you know, a coach, you know, a nine-year-old or 10-year-old, whatever comes in and a police investigation is, is initiated. And sometimes the police are notified of these cases through DCF. The, the complaint actually comes in through a teacher. The teacher contacts DCF. DCF then sends a 737 form over to the police to initiate a, a criminal investigation because the police do criminal investigations and the DCF in investigates uh, neglect and abuse. So um, it's very common that the, the DCF who works very quickly will get uh, it's what, they, what they call substantiate the complaint and get that person on the central registry fairly quickly. Um, the process by which, and I, this may be to, to the point here, the process by which you know, we, we initiate a criminal arrest takes significantly longer. Um, so I think that's hopefully answers your question. Yeah, I think uh, I learned from a tragic case in my town and community that we always have this anticipation that the law enforcement works in a 45 minute episode of law and order. Yeah. And of course that's not the case. Um, but when we, you know, in our town, the call that 
precipitated a tremendous investigation. It was a two year process between call and arrest. And even then, once the arrest occurred, due process hadn't occurred because the civil trial hadn't happened. But but while that investigation was happening, if that person was on the DCF registry, they would not be able to continue to interact with children in the school based setting or coaching setting. And so um, that due process will carry out. But that was a good like uh, harbinger of you know, danger, um, it coal mine in the canary, so to speak, the DCF registry, um, predates the, the ability for an arrest to happen in due process. So I think I, I understand, uh, representative Dauphine's concerns, but it seems like as representative Linehan mm -hmm. mentioned that this might be a good way for us to, before the legal systems and it's time consuming, you know, process that it takes time for you all to do your work, that this might be something that could keep children safe while an investigation occurs. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, I think it's important to note, too, that um, it's not uncommon for someone to land on the DCF registry based on that initial complaint. And the police are unable to, you know, establish enough probable cause to get to an arrest. Um, that happens. And, you know, it's, it's a very frustrating thing, especially when you believe in your heart of hearts as the investigator that it happened. Um, but I think to maybe rep represent Dauphine's point, the, the threshold for DCF to get somebody on that list is significantly lower. Um, and so they may end up on that list, even when there was no arrest. That's why that list and, and, you know, referencing that list in a background check is so important. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank your you. expertise as we talk about this. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Next up, we have Representative Boyd. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Howard. I apologize. I came in late. Uh, back and forth between public safety, as many of you are. Um, yeah. Just, and, and I understand the concept of the bill and its importance, and, and I certainly applaud you for bringing it forward for discussion. My, my question is more kind of a wonky government administration type questions. And, um, you know, with the camp side, which I've been working pretty heavily with, you know, there's a clear delineation where OEC already has cognizance over camps in daycare centers and in the school setting, schools, the State Department of Ed has cognizance. Um, you know, youth sports is very different, right? Because in right. many cases, they're startup nonprofits. Um, you know, it, with, with this to go forward, did you put any thought or have any idea of how, you know, this will get administered? Is it going to be on an honor system? Is it going to be, I, I don't know. I just started thinking about it as we're talking. So yes, so basically how are you getting, what, what is the catch to make sure that organizations are doing this? Right. And I think the answer to your question is the same, the same way that, that we police most things. Um, once something goes, goes awry, uh, we get involved and, and start to figure out where it went wrong and who's accountable. Uh, whether we're talking about car accidents in a civil uh, scenario or certainly in a criminal scenario when you talk about how many people were involved um, in things, and I could, you know, outline without too much detail cases where, you know, there were people involved that weren't the actual suspect who committed the crime, but they aided that that individual through their own negligence or or in, on purpose sure. and found themselves criminally liable. So, um, I think it would give, you know, the police who are investigating these these crimes um, rise to to hold those people responsible who didn't comply with the law that set this situation into motion, if that answers your question. So, yeah, because I could imagine if I, you know, if I'm an agency rep for Department of Ed or OEC and I'm auditing this hearing today, I'm thinking, oh, what, what is the committee going to make this my responsibility? And, you know, they're staffing. So I, I guess are you envisioning saying that you have to do it. And then if something happens and they were negligent in, in following the guidelines, then they could be held liable. Is that kind of, if I'm well, following your thinking? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and I don't like to speak for the state's attorney's office, but, you know, when you uh, take the crime of risk of injury to a minor, for example, or sure. you, you know, recklessly put a, put a minor at, at risk for uh, to be injured or, or even their morals impaired, you know, you could be looking at that. And I think that if, you know, that gets around, you know, these sports organizations have a network, you know, we have fundraising networks, we have a lot of things. So when this gets out and, um, you know, folks realize, hey, the law says I have to do this, they're going to do it. Right. I, yeah. I mean, you know, no, nobody sets out to to violate, you know, statutes when they're when they're running these programs. These are well-intended folks that run it. Um, but, yeah. you know, they, they need good volunteers, too. So we need to make yeah. sure they're well-intended as well. 
because I think most people are uh, are certainly not. Uh, uh, they certainly understand the concept and are supportive and want to make sure that we have safe sports. As we all know, you know, predators will look for unfettered access to children and and find those avenues where the supervision is not there. Um, but, you know, we also have to figure out the wonky government side of how we're going to implement this into the structure of state government. And, and that's not as easy as some others because there's no clear lanes as to who regulates uh, although I suppose the arguments there that we did a lot of work around concussions a couple of sessions ago, and that didn't fall uh, and that didn't fall cleanly into to somebody's bailiwick either. So anyway, you were here, so I figured I'd ask the question as the proponent. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it. So, and if I could just uh, real quick on that, Representative, just you know Please. the other thing that the other thing is a lot of you know in order to to play sports, you need someone to play against. You know what I mean, or compete against. So a lot of times, whether it's you know Little League or Babe Ruth, or in my case the Southern New England Youth Football Conference, there's a governing body above the um, above the, your, your individual program. So for example, in concussions, when, when, my, when my players show up to their weigh-in annually, I have to present for each coach the, the heads up to show that they were properly trained mm -hmm. and that one of them has CPR. We have all the, our own things. So, so there would be a catch there, I think, to your point. Okay, that's fair. Thank you, sir. Thank yes, you, Madam sir. Chair. You're welcome. Representative Lynn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, hello, Representative. Uh, nice to see you again. Pleasure. Uh, just uh, I had to step away for a second, so if this question was already asked, uh, forgive me, but I just wanted to uh, just uh, circle back real quick on the uh, uh, DCF Abuse and Neglect Registry. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot here, but I was just wondering, is there, could you give me some um, real-world uh, scenarios, examples where perhaps uh, somebody um, should be on and remain on the uh, DCF abuse and neglect registry and not necessarily uh, have a criminal conviction? Yeah, that ha that's not uncommon at all. So there, so I don't want to get too deep into this, but the threshold to, to make an arrest by our constitution and the way that our courts and our laws work, you have to establish a, a burden of proof that we call probable cause which we generally define as facts and circumstances that, that lead a reasonable person to believe this person committed that particular offense. However, in most of these cases, these arrests are done by warrant. And when you have that sort of a comprehensive investigation that a state's attorneys are gonna have to prosecute, their burden of proof is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So there's a small burden of proof to get into the, the ju judicial system, but a very high burden to become convicted. And oftentimes, you know, if a prosecutor looks at a, at a warrant and says, geez, I, you know, it's going to be really, really difficult to prove, they may not get signed. And I don't fault them for that. I certainly understand the burden that they're, they have to do. And, and that's, that's our system of government. And I don't think it's perfect, but I think it works. But it, to your point, oftentimes the police cannot get to that threshold to make the arrest. However, DCF, which is a completely separate entity, void of all of that process, um, substantiates the complaint and that name ends up on the central registry and then I'll let you guys debate from there what happens but um, you know so I, I think I hope that answered your question I, without, I mean I could give you you know case by case but it, it's not uncommon at all because a lot of these instances you have to understand too are you know the, the, the suspect and the, and the victim were alone and we don't get the report till sometime much later so a lot of times forensic evidence is sort of out the window um, and it's also important to know that, you know, a lot of forensic evidence puts people in places. So to say that they were both in the same place, well, we already knew that. Um, but what happened because of that? And, and that, you know, that gets lost and you end up with the, the word of a child versus the word of, of a monster. Uh, so, you know, th that, that's where you're at. And, and it's tough. And, and you know, it's, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's one of the most frustrating parts of my job. But unfortunately. So, so if I understand you correctly, obviously for a criminal conviction, Beyond a reasonable doubt, one hundred percent certainty. Nine, now the nine. the uh, the D, the uh, DCF uh, abuse and neglect registry is that more likely than not? Is that like a fifty one percent threshold? Is it somewhere in the middle? That seventy five percent? Excuse me. I'm not sure um, specifically because I don't work in DCF if they do it on a preponderance of the evidence or a clear and convincing evidence standard. But I, but I will tell you that. There's been many cases where we could not establish probable cause in the eyes of the court, and in some cases, my own eyes, um, with the evidence there. That doesn't mean I don't think it happened, and that there's an important delineation there. Um, but, but just because I think it happened, 
it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what we can prove. And there's, there's oftentimes where we can't reach that probable cause standard. Um, if you want to put numbers on it, I would say that's probably around 50%, you know, and that's just, you know, speculation um, anecdotally for me. But um, theirs is lower because they get people on that list. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I don't believe, oh, actually, I have another question for you. So please forgive me, but as the chair, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So um, I wanted to ask you, are you aware of the central database of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport? I'm, are you I'm aware, aware of that, that database? I'm aware that it exists. I, I won't be able to speak as intelligently on that representative as I can about the more local things, but I am aware that it exists, yes. Okay, so um, the former chair of this committee, re former representative Diana Urban and I have been discussing this for quite some time. Uh, and um, we are both under the belief, and I apologize if it was not made into um, this current LCO. The Central Database of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport is a federally funded national organization founded in 2017 and located in Denver, Colorado, and it should be incorporated into state and municipal background checks for all persons overseeing or coaching youth sports. This national organization is responsible for investigation, document, documentation, and if warranted, suspension of persons involved in incidences of sexual, emotional, or physical abuse while overseeing or coaching youth athletes across all sporting disciplines. This sounds like this might be getting to that concern that you had in the beginning of your testimony. Is what that concern? What concern the, con that? the concern that it wasn't meeting certain standards. So, right. so since there is no cost to access this database, and the fact that this database um, was a direct result of Dr. Larry Nasser and his, ab his abuse of youth gymnasts, do you think that um, if we utilize this no cost database, we'd kind of be killing two birds with one stone? We'd be getting to the crux of, the, of a, a deeper look at some of these individuals while also not providing um, additional cost to the organizations. So let me first say that I currently hold uh, the former representative's seat and I have the utmost respect for uh, Representative Urban and, and all of her time in the legislature. And let me, uh, my understanding, and again, I, I wouldn't swear to this, but my understanding of Safe Sport is that it's specific to people who have already engaged in um, inappropriate activity as a coach, trainer, et cetera. So for that regard, I think you, you're right. Except what it would miss is if somebody was, say, an uncle who abused a niece or a nephew, um, I don't know that and, and got convicted or on the central registry, I'm not sure that they would, they would show up on Safe Sports database. I think Safe Sports database is specifically people that have already targeted uh, children within their command as a coach already. But, but I wouldn't swear that, but that's my understanding. No, I agree with you. I, I think that is the case. And I wasn't talking an or situation. I was talking an and situation. An and, yeah. So, adding it to the bill. Yeah, yeah. Adding it to the bill, I think is phenomenal because to your point, it's free and it, and it, and it really, you know, it gets to that, you know, if you wanted to call them a niche of people that are, have already uh, shown their propensity to, to target individuals through this medium of, of volunteer coaching and training. Uh, so in addition to, but I, yeah, so we, I think we're in agreement. We just slightly, I misunderstood you, but uh, yeah, to do it in addition to, but certainly not uh, in place of a, right. uh, a, a national search. Right. And then one last question um, uh, it listed in here, it does talk about emotional abuse mm -hmm. um, as a coach. If you heard a coach of a 12 year old girl call her fat and lazy, would you agree that that's emotional abuse? Yeah, that that would happen one time and one time only in my program, um, and, and and if that, <laughs> uh, I knew I, I liked I would, you, Representative Howard. <laughs> yeah, you know, listen, I, I, I'll tell you, you know, coaching kids can be frustrating sometimes, and it takes a certain person. If you're not that person, it doesn't make you less of a person. It just means you're not going to be in my program. That's all. So um, uh, we have had coaches sometimes where you know I they don't go to that degree but they get a little too stern and we have a conversation that it's not how things go here and, and everything goes fine. But certainly that would happen one time in my program. It's not a crime, um, unfortunately, but they would be, uh, 
yeah, they would be bounced immediately. That's but exactly that was my point. It's not a crime, but it right. uh, it can be seen as emotional abuse. Correct. Um, and that could be something that's in the safe sport. And um, I would, yeah, yeah. That, that should catch safe sport for the yeah exactly, and that would okay, render great. that person um, you know, in my in my best estimation, disqualified. And I think in just about uh, any program of anybody I know, they would they would render them disqualified. I agree. And so with that, um, that concludes our questions. Thank you so much. I feel like you're now an honorary member of this committee. <laughs> well, I appreciate so it. Long. <laughs> Thank I you so very it. much. Thank you all as well. Have a great day. You as well. Um, we do have uh, five minutes left in the hour. So we're going to continue with, um, uh, with our uh, members of the legislature. Um, and so that's going to go to, I'm sorry, I can't see my list. Sarah Egan, uh, our child advocate. Ms. Egan, are you with us? I am. There you are. Uh, hello, sorry, my computer was uh, a little slow on the uptake there. Uh, good afternoon. No, it's great. Mm -hmm. Happy to see you. Welcome. Thank you. And good afternoon to you, Representative Linehan, um, and the other members of the Children's Committee today. Um, appreciate being here, really appreciated listening to that testimony. Um, real, such an important issue and, and the questions are really sophisticated and important. Um, so I appreciate your, your having those bills on for today. I wanted to concentrate my testimony today on the bills that you have regarding uh, an act concerning school-based mental health clinics, an act requiring the provision of information concerning children's mental health services in hospital emergency rooms, and an act requiring the provision of information concerning mental and emotional health resources by um, school districts. Um, and I wanted to use it as an opportunity not only to support those bills, which I think are incredibly important for a variety of reasons, but to also talk as we've been talking about in many other forums recently and in other committees as well in the legislature, that we have got to do more and urgently to support children's mental health right now, you know, short term and medium term. You know, colleagues across the state have been talking about, um, you know, COVID is, is, a, is, a, is a national disaster. You know, not just for the folks who have caught the infection and, and need to be treated um, and have had serious disease, but for our children and our families. We see this in so many different ways that our kids are not okay. And the impact of a year of pandemic and the associated uh, changes that it has wrought for children and families has created a crisis that absolutely needs uh, new approaches, urgent approaches, and, and frankly, a different allocation of dollars to support children's mental health and families. I like the focus of the bills that, that look at, I think, two areas of our system that need improvement. One is how do we share information with families? Families are so lost. Why do so many families go to the emergency room for care? We have a serious problem in our emergency rooms right now. I know you, that, that members of this committee are on other meetings uh, with me and others. I know you've heard from Connecticut Children's Medical Center and others, uh, but for those that don't know, Connecticut Children's Medical Center moved to universal suicide screening for all children that enter the ED for any reason starting at age 10. They have about a 97% um, success rate with screening. And their data has told them over the last year and a half that they've seen a significant increase in the number of children who are screening positive on suicide screenings beginning at age 10. And that in, by November of 2020, 24% of children coming into the emergency department for any reason in their hospital screened positive on a suicide screening. The OCA partnered with colleagues around the state to put out a public health alert this November after a spate of five youth suicides in five weeks of our young people. Um, in Connecticut, like other states, has seen a decrease in the age at which children take their own life. And we know that suicide is now the second leading cause of preventable death for children starting at age 10 in Connecticut as well. Families that show up at the emergency room do so because they are in crisis, they need help, they don't know where else to go. One statistic I wanted to share with you that's not in my written testimony for today, um, but was studied a, just a couple of years ago in Connecticut is that, is that over 35% of children, this is mostly Medicaid covers because that's where a lot of the data is, but over 35% of children uh, entering our emergency rooms 
um, were not connected to community-based follow-up within 30 days of discharge. That is a huge problem. A huge, and part of that is how do we, and my testimony, and I, and forgive me for going beyond the scope of the bills, but, but all, all of us sit in a lot of different forums. Some of you sit in different committees. Uh, the Appropriations Committee is going to be hearing the, the budgets from the state agencies over the next couple of weeks. And so I wanted to use my testimony or written testimony today to go through, I think, a series of recommendations um, that, I, that I think need to be looked at to improve children's mental health um, now and in, the, and in the immediate future. I just want to run through a couple of those. Just pull it up right here. Excuse me, just taking one second. Okay. The other, the other data point I wanted to give you, according to our, uh, our, our meetings with our colleagues at CCMC, is that in any given day last week, they had more than 30 children sitting in the emergency department in need of mental health treatment, many of whom were in need of inpatient um, hospitals that they could not access. And the doctors at CCMC are reporting to us that the average length of stay right now for a child in their emergency department was a week. I mean, that's an astonishing uh, statistic. And while Connecticut has made a number of improvements to its community-based mental health services over the last decade, we continue to struggle with those surges in our emergency departments. And we continue to struggle with the right balance, I think, of hospital beds, intermediate level of care, and access to intensive community-based services, including care coordination, and including uh, an area that these bills are focused on today, which is how to integrate mental health care with, um, with schools. We have some of that in Connecticut, we need a lot more. And I think as I looked at the testimony from others um, who are gonna present to the committee today, I think you're gonna hear a lot more about that and why that's so important from a range of folks, from school superintendents to social workers, uh, to hospital personnel. We know that the partial or the closure of partial closures of school in the last year have contributed to surging children's mental health crisis, but experts are predicting that the full reopening of school will also bring new challenges for children and a likely new surge of children into emergency care settings because schools are historically the biggest source of referral to local emergency departments. So we have to look at, as some of the bills today look at, what do families get when they go to the emergency room? What kind of information are they getting? How are they getting connected to community-based care? And how do we make access to care easier for them? It is absolutely essential, essential, that schools and community-based mental health providers be able to partner in every school district across Connecticut, and that barriers to co-location of services and care coordination be eliminated. We have to also look at rate and reimbursement issues across our children's mental health service delivery system that create additional barriers to timely and comprehensive delivery of mental health services. So a couple of other recommendations I wanted to highlight for the committee. We do have a problem right now with our children in the numbers in the emergency departments and the inability to timely access inpatient psychiatric hospital beds. I think it would be important to talk for legislators to hear from the Connecticut Hospital Association and the state's Office of Health Strategies to understand what our excess hospital bed capacity is right now and how many of those beds could potentially or need to be repurposed for children's uh, and adolescent psychiatric beds. We need to think about disaster relief funds to support access to acute and intermediate level of care uh, as part of our COVID response in the state of Connecticut. Number two, we have to think about access to care coordination for children in the emergency departments and children in our schools. We wanna increase access to funded care coordination for families whose children are in hospitals or present to emergency departments with acute mental health needs and care coordination should continue for a set period beyond discharge. And again, I refer back to that 35% number. If 35% of kids leaving the ED are not connected with a co the community-based service within a month, then that's, that's a big problem and care coordination could help with that. Funding to support that initiative can go to DSS or to DCF. We need to improve referrals and connections to children in crisis by co-locating co community crisis social workers in high volume emergency departments. One way to do that is the state provides direct funding to DCF for emergency mobile crisis services. Part of that money is then reimbursed 
um, by insurance payers. We need to look at whether we can increase those dollars to support greater capacity in our emergency mobile crisis, co-locate social workers into some of our high volume emergency departments and into some of our school districts that are high drivers of referrals to the emergency department. Number four, we need to increase access to hospital step down level of care and ensure access for children with developmental disabilities. That is a huge hole in our children's mental health system right now and the children who are most likely to be stuck in the emergency room. And I mean, not just for days, but for weeks, weeks on end, are children who have co-occurring developmental disabilities. I happen to think that that's a legal problem for the state of Connecticut as well, because we cannot fund a continuum of care that has no room for children that, with an IQ on under 70 or under 60. And that unfortunately is the system that we have right now. The Department of Developmental Services for, um, has, uh, is looking at a, 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 a funding, a step down level of care for, um, for kids with IDD. Um, we need to make sure that money stays in the budget. That's absolutely, and is done in such a way that that support is Medicaid reimbursable. Um, just a couple of more uh, recommendations. Number five, as the Connecticut Hospital Association er, has urged, as well as the Department of Children and Families, we need to create community-based psychiatric urgent care, um, urgent care centers. That's been recommended by lots and lots of folks. We haven't done it yet in the state of Connecticut. To improve access to care at the optimal level of care and reduce over-reliance on emergency departments. Number six, we need to immediately take steps to fund respite services. I would recommend mandating that state agencies that support our children's mental health care delivery system develop a plan to ensure provision and coverage of respite services to families whose children have chronic and acute care needs. The lack of respite care is one of the biggest holes in our system right now for families who have children with acute needs. And while this would require a state outlay, the provision of respite care is, less, is likely less expensive, particularly in-home respite than payment for higher levels of care needed when treatment plans in the community fail as a result of lack of respite. As a first step, I would recommend the state could fund DSS to support a pilot-based respite project and study its efficacy. And Seven, Sarah, do you uh, have the, excuse me for interrupting, I'm uh, just wondering, these points, do you have them in written testimony? Because we're all trying to take furious notes. Oh, they're all uh, written. You don't have my we don't, testimony? No, they're it's all written not, down. It's not up yet. So, oh, uh, so we it. definitely want to have this in written testimony. I have all um, because yeah. it is something we really do want to look into. Um, so, if you want to just go through the last points quickly, yeah. and then we can start sure. asking you a hundred questions. Sure. Um, we need. We could. We could. And I wanted to try create recommendations that are concrete for legislators to think about, particularly those who serve on multiple commit multiple committees that deal with children's mental health. We can increase support for the state's Access Mental Health Psychiatric Consultation Program. We can, number eight, we need to support our nonprofit providers to do mental health disaster relief in our communities. And I have some specifics underneath that one. We need to ensure, and this circles back to some of the bills that are up here today, we need to ensure that schools can strategically use federal stimulus dollars to serve our highest need students and ensure that schools are Ensure that schools are providing and have the needed resources to provide safe in-person learning opportunities for our most vulnerable and high need students. OCA recently requested data from the State Department of Education asking that absenteeism and attendance data be broken down for children with certain types of disabilities. And what we learned is that during COVID, one third to more than one half of children with certain disabilities have been chronically absent from school during the pandemic, leaving children and families isolated and in greater crisis. We need to ensure that schools use the federal stimulus dollars to partner with community-based agencies to support children's mental health and care coordination. And we should allocate a portion of those dollars to partnerships with these agencies that can assist with mental health screening, support and case management efforts or in the context of these bills, co-locating the delivery of mental health services in the context and environment of school. Um, and I would echo one of the recommendations from superintendents today that we need to provide direct support for the state suicide uh, prevention board and its new five-year plan to prevent suicide across the lifespan. I know that these recommendations went beyond the, the language of the particular bills, 
but there's so much that we need to do that we can do right now. I wanted to provide that all in one place for you. Thank you for indulging my time today. Thank you so much. I really look forward to um, seeing that written testimony and sharing it with everyone. Um, I, do, I, I do just have some comments that go along with your testimony. So you talked about coordination. Um, from the research that I've been doing, care coordination is actually not reimbursed through Medicaid. And that is a, that's a major issue, right? Um, so, but because that is such a, a bigger issue that likely will not be um, fixed within this legislative session, because as you know, these things take some time. Um, that's where this bill actually came from, is the fact that we're not funding care coordination under Medicare or Medicaid rather. And um, and so we were hoping then that we could um, the provision of information be distributed to kids in emergency room. Uh, this came from Representative Nolan, who is a police officer in New London who actually sees this firsthand. There is some testimony, however, from um, the hospital association that essentially says, and I'm gonna paraphrase, it says, hey, we think this is a really great idea, but we don't need a bill to do it. We're going to do it on our own. So the question then becomes, the child advocate, have you seen hospitals do this on their own with any regularity? I don't know that I'm in a position to, to, to know what hospitals are distributing on a regular basis. I can say that I have in the past supported bills that, um, that, that, that promote this kind of information sharing. The legislature passed a bill in 2015 um, requiring that hospitals provide safe sleep information consistent with American Academy of Pediatric recommendations to all caregivers. And having had a baby since 2015, I can tell you that it, I definitely it. received different information uh, the third time around. So I am a proponent of that. And I do think Representative Linehan, that um, I think that, and we hear this from a lot of families and, and I mean no disparagement or disrespect to the incredible work that our emergency um, room physicians are doing, but a lot of families leave just as lost as when they came in, if not more so, and increasingly losing confidence in their own capacity to safely care for their children. So we know they're not getting the information and connections and referrals that they need. Yeah, you know, um, and I and I understand that. And actually, you know, I speak from experience. Um, and so uh, we have not seen anything from emergency rooms that actually give um, information on how to find better access to care. Uh, so I believe that this is necessary, and I appreciate the testimony of others that say we can do it all on our own, but in my experience, it hasn't been done on, our, on their own, and then in your past experience that you've seen that once we passed a bill, it actually did happen. Um, so I appreciate that. One last question from me. Um, you talked about Access Mental Health Connecticut. So for those on the committee who aren't aware, Access Mental Health Connecticut is um, sort of a phone service for pediatricians where if they feel that um, they're seeing a patient for um, psychiatric illness um, and they are, it's kind of a little bit above what their training is that they can reach out to um, psychiatrists on this call line to get information on, on next steps. I totally agree with you um, that uh, funding is required. Um, for greater access to access mental health Connecticut. But do you think that that line can also possibly be used for care coordination? When you say that line, I'm just not sure. So the, the, the phone line, the, you know, the access mental health, you know, cause you're talking to um, a psychiatrist because in my personal experience, um, they did work in, as in essence, as a care coordinator, just through the pediatrician. So um, is there any way that you see for us to expand the scope of Access Mental Health Connecticut that could get us to some of the places that we're lacking because of lack of uh, Medicaid reimbursement? That's a good question. Um, I wouldn't have thought of that as sort of a hub for care coordination. I, I also wanted to share with the committee that Beacon Health Options um, reported to, to the OCA that the volume at, um, at Access 
mental health Connecticut has increased 40% during the pandemic, but that that 40% does not represent, there's still big swaths of pediatric offices across the state of Connecticut that don't access that psychiatric consultation hub. So there's definitely room for growth there and continued engagement and potentially not only just with pediatric offices, but with emergency departments that may not have child psychiatry readily available um, to children that are presenting in, in their emergency departments. The question about care coordination is interesting. I do think it's important to think about what do we mean when we say court care coordination? Is it somebody on the phone that's helping me? Is it somebody that's gonna come meet with my family? Is it somebody that's gonna sort of stay with me until we have warm handoffs to the community, to, to those community-based supports? Um, and the fact that insur insur it's been hard to get insurance to pay for care coordination um, um, is a concern. Some insurers have started to do it. I do, I do think we should look at opportunities to increase access in addition to the school-based mental health piece access to care coordination in our emergency departments and in our schools and maybe grant funded to this to some of the state agencies to fund some of those positions or increase funding for emergency mobile psychiatric services which now has a different acronym but I still use the old one I think it's community mobile crisis now um, to increase their that capacity right that's 211 um, right. that's supposed to be diversion from emergency departments but if we look at what that capacity is do we need a little bit more there to co-locate sort of senior mobile crisis clinicians in some of our high volume emergency departments or even in some of our high need school or far flung school districts right who have less access uh, to community supports and and to be able to work with families directly share information with them um, help them be, be they're so lost families need, need yeah. so much more support. So those are a couple of different line items in the state budget that we could look at, um, you know, to, to, I think, increase access to care coordination. Thank you very much for that. And I will say that I did speak um, with someone on the Appropriations Committee today talking about the possibility of funding some of these things through a grant, through the CARES money, the, the, the CARES Act money. The problem with that is, is that when that money's gone, the, we will be forced to find money to fund it in our regular budget. Um, and, and we're going to have this fight all over again. But when we can save, when we can help people and, and help families, I think we need to do it however we can. We just have to remember to continue that conversation once it goes into a grant program and we're funding some of these things as advocates here on this committee and you yourself as the child advocate, we certainly can't be quiet. We have to continue to advocate for that funding through the actual state budget. And let, let me just make one, if I can make one suggestion there, is that coupling that state money with a data collection reporting requirement with, you know, what would we expect to accomplish from that kind of a direct, um, maybe medium term care coordination is reduced utilization of EDs, maybe other improved outcomes that that through the provision of modest care coordinate, you know, from a funding perspective, it's fairly modest compared to right. other costs, so that we can ultimately show that the provision of that service is a re leads to reduction in um, other acute care costs. I like it. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Anwar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Egan, again, for your testimony. You um, are very clear uh, in your words, and, and uh, you are raising the alarm for all of us as legislators, but also people in our state that uh, we are in a crisis mode, and we are seeing uh, the anticipated and expected part of this disaster impact our children. Um, I wanted to ask you a few things. Uh, one of them was, uh, uh, have you seen or have you had an opportunity to talk to the governor and his team and, and the administrative uh, executive branch of our government in, in the same level of clarity of, of the panic that we should all be under? Uh, well, we speak regularly with the executive branch agencies, right? So we meet with, um, we've had conversations with DSS, with DCF, with Office of Health Strategies um, about all of these issues. In fact, I had meetings just Friday and today with representatives from a variety of, of those agencies, all talking about these issues and what the strategies are uh, from a budget perspective and a healthcare perspective to implement some of the recommendations we're talking about. Because 
the reason I'm, I'm saying is that on the Medicaid end, we are not seeing a movement to, to provide the support. Uh, again, the children are something that we should never have any con confusion about what do we need to do. And then that's the beauty of our committee is that we agree more than we may disagree on. And then that's where, because children are the, the binding force for all of us uh, as a society and as people. But I'm not seeing the same level of panic in the actions of the policies that are coming from the executive end. Uh, and, and, and that's why I'm, I'm seeing where is that disconnect? Why uh, do we legislators have to do far more when we will, we should, and we will? Uh, then then wh why is there a disconnect? Who is not listening? And what can we do that people would listen to what's going on? Because we are in a disaster mode right now. And then you've clearly stated that too. Yes, and I think that, I think, Senator, I appreciate those remarks, and I think you'll hear that from other folks who are going to be testifying today and um, people who were testifying in the Human Services Committee last week as well on issues related to telehealth and access to care. I, I think folks are, 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 are think there's a, a bandwidth, right? I mean, the, the state is in a state of emergency, and in trying to keep up with um, you know, so many priorities related to the public health um, that I, but I do think that it is incumbent upon, you know, folks in my office and, and we'll look to do as much as we can to communicate um, to our state partners and, and as we're doing to you all um, across government that, you know, that these issues, they just have to be, they have to be a priority, you know, and it, and it might get worse for kids. It might get worse for kids before it gets better. Um, and we, as we think about disaster relief from a public health perspective, the state has to have an urgent strategic plan around children's mental health. Um, there's a lot of things we do right on children's mental health in the state of Connecticut, but we are in a, you know, this is a, this is a, nat a, a natural disaster for our kids. And the school districts are going to need the support and the communities are going to need the support and the community providers who do the essential work day in, day out, um, need the support. And so I think we all have to push more. The, the other thing was, um, right now, we have uh, workforce issues on the mental health end for children. I mean, for adults, we have had them, but for children, it's far more significant. Uh, if somebody needs to, to see a child psychiatrist, um, they might as well go and, and maybe uh, play lotto um, because the odds may be better that way to, to get it right away. And then that's pretty scary. And, and, and um, through some of the other committees, I've been asking uh, public health uh, personnel to have incentives like other states have done, but I'm not getting any traction. So um, maybe you can do more uh, or, or so th th there's almost like we are living in two different planets. Uh, when it comes to having those conversations and then asking for getting trained personnel for the immediate needs. So um, again, your conversations with them, if, if more people say the same thing, maybe they will have more opportunity. I'm just putting a list of things I think worthy to, to put there. And the same thing about the nonprofits. We actually, in our budget that the, we received, the nonprofits were just on status quo. And, and as if they are not doing anything. And that remains a part of our challenge that are we in a disaster and are they helping and are our children real priority? And, and yes, everybody says yes. I said, well, then where are those in the numbers? And then when we look at the numbers, it's not in the numbers. So um, to me, when we say it's a priority, then we have to back it up with financial support. And, and I'm not seeing it. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm just um, um, repeating what you're saying, but except I'm pointing fingers now. Uh, that that it, has to, uh, it has to show in numbers because uh, uh, otherwise it's only words. And, and, um, and if it's only words, then, then they don't matter anymore because we need to have action and we need to have funding backing that up at this time. So, so that's a, a part. Why do you think that the insurance industry is refusing to address this issue when payments come. So Medicaid is okay, we take the ownership as a state for the Medicaid, but we also have to speak about the insurance industry's lack of or willing, lack of willingness to address this or pay for uh, the appropriate level of support and coordination when Massachusetts has shown that uh, uh, risk through risk contracts, coordination is able to improve outcomes in adults and children.
So it's black and white, and we always hide behind being the insurance capital of the world. And, and then we actually take away the opportunities from the people in the state as insurance capital of the world, saying that we actually are immune to being responsible for anything because we have insurance capital, whereas other states have actually evolved and, and, and had the insurance industry do better. What can we do about that when we have data to support these things work? Yeah, I, I think those, that's an excellent question, not one I'm as, as prepared to answer on the insurance side. You know, our colleagues from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, um, I think, would be able to speak to you more knowledgeably about why that's been a coverage challenge, Senator Anwar. I do know that there are certain providers who have had success with getting some private insurers in Connecticut, and I believe um, my colleagues at Clifford Beers in New Haven have success, successfully worked with some insurers to pay for care coordination by reviewing that exact same data that you're you're talking about and 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 the Im resulting improvements in care and reduction of costs which is why I made the suggestion to representative Linehan that any state dollars that are used to um, I mean the reality is in Connecticut that our, a lot of our state agencies Department of Children and Families Department of Developmental Services they back clean up for the holes in our health care system right? You know, both agencies have a voluntary services program, DCF funds access um, the mental health consult, the psychiatric consultation hub, they fund the mobile crisis services. Um, and there are opportunities, I think, in Connecticut to look at the state dollars that we expend making up for those holes in our healthcare system, um, that some of which are expensive, and in strategic maximizing opportunities for reimbursement from payers. There's some of that in Connecticut. There's some of that. Um, and I can talk with you more about that, but I think we could do I think we could do more on that front as well. But we expend a lot of state dollars making up for those holes, you know, yeah. on, on the insurance side. Thank you so much. And 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 finally about the school-based uh, mental health that that that's the, the model for the school-based health centers. I think that is a bigger success story than we have collectively recognized. And, and, and that is an area of opportunity for expansion collectively. And I think that's why this bill and then certain other opportunities for expansion of support would be a, a step in the right direction. How do you feel about that? I, I think the more we can deliver mental health care in the places that children are, uh, the better. Right. And so we have some of that. We have some of that um, already. We have the school based health clinics. We also have, again, you know, DCF that provides the grant funding to support school based mental health initiatives. Um, that's another uh, line item that we can look to, to scale up. Again, we have DCF that grant funds. Um, so community based partner um, partnerships with schools that have been really successful, really successful in Connecticut. So part of, I think what we could do, yes, I mean, I like what the bill the bill is doing. Uh, I'm not an expert in sort of the regulatory structure for how to implement that. Um, but I think the goal of the bill is really, really important. And I think uh, collateral to that is an opportunity to look at the places in our state budget that fund um, usually through state agency funding successful, innovative, school-based uh, mental health initiatives, usually by DCF, and, and, and scale those up because they've been really effective. And I'll give you one example is that DCF and uh, philanthropy, the Dalio Foundation, fund, again, Clifford Beers in New Haven to partner with New Haven Public Schools to do case management uh, screening and wraparound services were needed to high need children in the New Haven Public Schools. Uh, you know, that program, which costs about $9 a day to support the child and the family, has produced data that shows um, reduced uh, clinical symptoms of PTSD, uh, reduced chronic absenteeism, and a range of better outcomes for the child at a price that is much, much lower than using an emergency room, which would probably you know, cost in one day of funding that program for a year, right? So those are the kind of initiatives we have to have a strategic plan around how do we scale that up? Um, because th that's, th that's the kind of work that we need to be doing in school districts and communities across Connecticut. Some school districts know how to do that. Some don't, right? And as the federal dollars flow in, 
Um, the, the ESSER money, for example, the $440 million of federal stimulus dollars for schools that has come into the state, you know, we have to make sure that a portion of that money is being directed to those kinds of school-based mental health initiatives and contracts and partnerships uh, between schools and community-based mental health agencies. I know that was a mouthful for me. Some of that's in my testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Egan, for being here. And then please keep your testimonies going for every place. We need your words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, Representative Wielander. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Oh, thank you. I just, I have about 800,000 thoughts in my head listening to everything you've been saying. Um, I won't go into all of them because that would take way too long. But I just wanted to touch upon a couple of things that you mentioned um, and specifically looking at the idea of the continuity of care and what we are hoping to do with these, these bills um, in making sure that there's a through line between our children in moments of crisis and getting the care that they need and then the follow-up um, and you know, if whatever other you know treatments are needed, um, you mentioned specifically the the screening um, survey that is being done by the uh, Children's Hospital in Hartford. I think it's a fantastic screening, and I hope that we could get it into as many healthcare facilities as possible. I've listened to those statistics on a couple different uh, meetings and and events. And they seem to be going up. Is that a pattern that you are anticipating to, to see continue to rise the number of children who are responding with uh, in the affirmative of, of having um, thoughts of self harm um, or just mental health concerns. So the, the latest data that I'm hearing out of CCMC, I think the peak was November, December with about 24% of kids screening positive. I think they're at about, about, last I heard, about 21%, which is still, um, you know, a statistically significant increase from where they were, you know, a year over a year plus ago, right? I can also say that, you know, my my colleagues around the state, the the physicians, the providers are concerned about, you know, the, you know, even when schools reopen fully, which is what we want, right? Which is what we want, but that that will create again another surge into emergency departments. You know, our children have had so much on their plate Schools are, you know, some school districts are a driver of emergency room referrals. Um, so, you know, that that's the prevailing thinking. Um, I, I don't know. I can I can absolutely see that happening. I mean, I'm seeing it on just in my own community how there's an uptick in anxiety, um, and as our schools can continue to open and the children have to adjust um, to the the new learning situation and our teachers um, as well and our staff and our parents. And that's one of the things that I'm really personally excited about with um, the school-based mental health clinics is the idea that there can be that, that family line through because oftentimes there is that the stress from the family life does permeate into um, the, the school room and the schoolhouse. And you know, there's one quote that I've heard that I think just speaks to a, a number of different things, but healthy kids make better learners. That was shared with me and that just made a ton of sense in terms of how we look at um, care and I just the one other thing that you mentioned um, that I wanted to bring up specifically was the the cost of care for especially specifically you were referring to the respite services but have you seen in general the 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 fact of cost of prevention care being much more, um, much lower. And I hate to put things like children's health into dollars amounts, but when we're looking at the cost of prevention programs versus the cost of treatment afterwards, that is that also something you're seeing consistently is, is much more efficient to look at, at things ahead of time? Oh, this uh, uh, representative, no question about it. And I think the example I just that I had just given Senator Anwar of the the, the New Haven wraparound program, um, costing about nine dollars a day, and with demonstrated efficacy, versus the cost of 
um, you know, child in crisis in school and 911 is called and an ambulance comes and the child goes and takes, you know, goes to the hospital for six hours to get discharged with likely no connection to anything. That's a $2,000 day mm -hmm. compared oh. to a service that, you know, a tier two kind of service that can support the family and the child for a year with greater efficacy. So there's no question that the upstream dollars are much, much, much less. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things, and I didn't put it in this in this hearing's testimony, but I, I've put it in, in other hearings is, we should be looking in one other place I'd look in Connecticut is to make sure we have a strategic multi-agency plan to support a birth to five continuum of home visiting infant and toddler mental health support services uh, for parents with who are pregnant and who have very young children, we would get a tremendous bang for our buck for doing that. But I'll save that for another hearing day. I agree with that as well. Um, no, thank you. I, I, I don't want to take any more time on this. I appreciate um, your, your input on all of these things and um, and I hope that we can continue to make this type of care as accessible as possible to our students and our school communities at large. So thank you. Thank you very much, Representative. Um, and Ms. Egan, I will say that birth to five is my absolute dream. I think we've discussed this before. Um, so I'm just gonna speak to you cryptically to tell you to get all of your information together on how great birth to five would be and we'll see you soon. How does that sound? <laughs> great, thank you so much. Seeing no other questions, you're free to go. Thank you, we appreciate you as always. Thank you so much, everyone, appreciate it. Uh, moving on, we're now into uh, members of the public. I'd like to welcome, please, Melanie Bonjour, uh, followed by Jesse Gleckel and Thomas Nicholas, please. Melanie, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So, good afternoon, Honorable Senator Anwar, Representative Linehan, Vice Chair Wielander, and ranking members of the Senator Martin and Representative. To finish, um, my name is Melanie Bonjour, and I'm the current president of the Connecticut Association of School-Based Health Centers, as well as a program manager for six school-based health centers that are located in the city of Danbury and the town of Newtown. Um, all of the health centers are operated by the Connecticut Institute for Communities, which is um, a federally qualified health center. Um, I really appreciate um, in, um, the conversation that was just held about um, the need for um, expanded um, Children's Health, Mental Health Services, Care Coordination, and the, um, the need to keep kids out of using the emergency room for um, mental health care crisis, as well as medical care. Um, it's episodic care, um, and it doesn't solve their problems, and it's very costly. And so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about school-based health centers and um, my experience and their success in um, both keeping kids out of the ER, but also um, meeting their needs um, in a very cost-effective way and um, from a preventive-focused um, perspective. Um, School-based health centers have been providing medical and behavioral health and oral health services on school grounds um, in Connecticut since the late 1980s. Um, designed to increase access to critical health care services through the removal of reported barriers to access to care, including but not limited to inability to pay for services, lack of insurance, um, provider shortage areas, limited or no transportation, limited culturally competent providers, and concerns about confidentialities. The school-based health centers in the late 80s and 90s were predominantly located in the larger cities where poverty rates were higher, barriers were greater, and um, where easy access to affordable health care services was not readily available. And they were initially established in such cities as New Haven and the city of um, Hartford. But over the past two decades, um, this highly successful health care delivery model has expanded to other areas of the state. And we currently have um, 92 DPH supported school-based cell centers and over, uh, I think, 17 communities. Uh, and they've expanded not only, um, you know, they're not only in the, the cities and towns, uh, but they've expanded in some of the few rural areas and suburban areas, including the town of Newtown. Um, I'm a Sandy Hook resident and I um, it was very close to the families and the children that were um, lost in the Sandy Hook tragedy. And 
um, as an advocate, I approached the, the school system and with the idea of the school-based model as a, a really viable quality healthcare service that would um, respond to the long, anticipated long-term healthcare needs, mental healthcare needs of children and the survivors of Sandy Hook. And, and the clinic has been very su successful in the community. Thank you, Ms. Bonjour. Your time is allotted, it's over. It's Thank over? You. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am, if you could just uh, summarize in a quick one or two sentences so we could start asking away. Sure, I, I, you know, I'm just gonna, I submitted testimony and I've been working in school-based for since 1993. Um, it, the, it's a multidisciplinary approach. Um, we have medical behavioral health providers and medical providers that work hand in hand in working with the school system on school grounds when kids are in school where kids are at. And um, we coordinate with the, the school district, we coordinate with um, community-based providers to effectively um, connect with the kids and provide the care um, that they that they need and if they don't show up for their follow-up visits we can find them in the classrooms the continuity of care is assured um, it's the the students that we've seen in the clinics um, we have data to show that if they're we're seen in a school-based health center connected with a school-based provider they're more likely to have continued uh, behavioral health visits referred to an outside provider their visits would be um um, they would follow through with those. Um, and Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony and we really look forward to the written testimony. I do want to open this up to members of the committee who may wish to ask you questions. Are there any questions? Uh, Representative Comey. Thank you very much. Hello, Melanie. Good to see you. Nice to see you as well. Um, the um, um, Department of Children and Families um, sent in a testimony claiming that um, that they uh, that they work with with um, uh, with providers in the community to provide mental health services to school-based health centers or districts. Can you explain what that? What, what I, I just wasn't aware of that and you know not in my district anyways I don't think but I'm wondering if, if you can explain they're not here I'm sorry to to explain it themselves but I was wondering if you have any understanding of of that model well we work in you know collaboration with the Department of Children and Families if we identify a student and you know that we're concerned about they're at risk um, you know we do referrals to DCF and then we coordinate. Um, I have one example of a student that is, um, I think I have an answer to your question. Um, a student that is a high school um, young lady who um, had a, a baby, 16 year old who had a baby. She was living in a household um, where there were, um, it was, and I'll say dysfunctional, I don't like to use that choice of words, but uh, she, um, his stepfather who lived in the household was the father of that child. She was a 16 year old that had a baby. And so the Department of Children and Families aware of the need or concerned about the needs for her health and well-being, meaning her physical care, her medical care, as well as the newborn reached out to the high school medical provider to um, connect her to do an um, annual well visit, to do um, her GYN care, um, to uh, provide her with any vaccines that she might need, um, and as well as to um, engage her in mental health um, services. Because again, the situation was um, a very, uh, I'll say dysfunctional one. Um, we also work to um, connect her to uh, areas where she could get clothing. She could get some job support um, so that she could start working. And so I, I think that care coordination um, is one example of how we've worked with DCF. Okay, so uh, they don't, um, it, it's not with every every school base, it's not with every district or with every, it's in the case of a, of a case I, that's it, under it, their purview, I guess is what is my point. It's not, it, it, there's not a set. This yeah. is not a standard practice, you know, and I know there's another the school based provider that's going to speak later on, but it's not a standard practice. You know, we do coordinate them again with if there's a DCF referral 136 is filed and then we work with the DCF workers to do the investigation and then 
to, you know, try to respond to the needs of that particular situation. The school staff are also involved in, in that so that, you know, moving forward that we address the, the concerns with the child. That particular case that I mentioned, it was a little bit more involved where that DCA broker, I think went above and beyond because of the concerns about that particular adolescent and reached out to the school-based health centers. And we, again, provided more service than what might be the traditional um, DCF services. Um, does that happen in, in all the school-based communities? I can't answer that question, but I do know that um, we do our best from the school-based provider perspective to you know, respond to the needs. And if DCF needs to be involved, we're very proactive with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Linehan. You're very welcome, Representative. Senator Anwar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I, I have uh, one of my towns, East Hartford, has about seven school-based health centers. And, and uh, I have had a chance to visit uh, every one of them and, and uh, had a chance to see the functioning. Um, and I see the ease of access. Um, could you speak a little bit uh, for the school-based nurses if they would feel insecure because of expansion of this? Because I, I know the answer to this, but I want you to be able to speak to this so that uh, any concerns that they might be uh, for that part of our, our workforce, our healthcare workforce, that we should reduce our concerns. Sure, um, that's a very good question. Um, the school based health center, the medical providers are typically APRNs, and um, we're not there to um, replace the school nurses. We're there to provide the next level of care on school grounds. You know, um, the the school based health centers, the success of school based health centers is when they come into a community is that there is a community conversation and dialogue, and a community planning group is should be involved in the conversation and, and establishment and placement of the school-based health center. And that includes school personnel, including school nurses who know, know those kids well, they're in that school every day, as, as well as school social workers, um, teachers, um, school administrators, and other members of the community. Um, and through that planning process, this, the, it's an opportunity for the school-based health center, the school nurses to understand that it's a true partnership that we're not there to replace. And the school nurses act as triage for us. Um, are there concerns at times with you know, the state budget crisis, the, the state department of ed, you know, in the schools cutting? I think in, initially in some situations there may be some because of lack of understanding or um, lack of um, clarity about the school-based health center and the school role. There are times when there may be some concern about um, their jobs, but we find that once the school-based health centers are reached, the staff are in the school, they're working with the school and community and through communication, they really become great partners and it's a very close and strong relationship. Um, we do, all of the school-based health centers have a collaborative agreement, which the school nurses and the school-based health center providers sign. It's required by DPH and it, it provides clarity and clarification on the, the role and the partnerships and the co regular communication that must be had because the school nurses, again, they're there every day with the students. They refer the students and the, the school-based health centers, um, you know, communicate back with them about the care. So you know, the short answer is on a case by case basis, there may be some concern, but once the school based health center providers are in that school building, they really, I think there's a, a great collaborative effort and um, those fears dissipate. And, and one last question, the, the parent entities, I understand that the parent entities do have um, outside the school um, opportunities as well for um, later time of the day or, or parents interaction or, or providing care to the entire family. So is that pretty much universal? Yes, the, 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 the school-based health centers, we have to have all of the students that are served in the school-based health center must have, must have a assigned enrollment form or parental um, permission form. 
um, to treat their child because the children are minors. Having communication with those families regarding the disposition of the care, what was assessed in the clinic, um, and to engage them in the ongoing care. Um, and we talk, we're, this bill was focusing on mental health, to have the parents involved in that, that discussion and be part of the, the, the care team is very, very important. So the, the, whether it's a, a school-based nurse practitioner, a school-based um, clinical social worker, or in some cases dental, we have regular communication with the families so that the parents are involved in the care and, and the students and the families are compliant with the care. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're very welcome, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Representative Dauphiné. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Melanie, for coming to testify. You may have already answered my question through Senator Anmar, but I'm just trying to understand, uh, get a better understanding of how the ones, we don't have any in our schools in our district. So we're trying to understand exactly how they operate. You mentioned that there would have to be parental permission to participate. Does that would that include with the mental health side of it as well? And that's a good question. Um, so um, with mental health, uh, a provider in any setting is um, allowed to um, see a child for up to six visits without parental consent. That's to so that, you know, the child doesn't um, doesn't avoid getting the care that they need. If they reach out, they want to engage them. Um, in school-based health centers, um, a clinician can see a child for a mental health visit without a parental permission form um, for up to six visits. However, um, it, it's, it, it is important, as I mentioned earlier, to engage the family in that, that care plan for that child. And so the intention is to see that child for a visit and it's early in the visit as possible to um, engage the child so that they are comfortable in having the care, the family involved in that care plan. And then the family is engaged at that time and we get a parental permission form. Um, but the enrollment form it, it, for medical, um, we do not see a child until that, unless that um, permission form is on file. So it gathers, you know, the contact information for the parents, it collects, um, the medical information on that child, and it also collects some billing information. Um, if insurance is available, that we do bill for services for both medical and behavioral health. So does that answer your question? So if a child, well, let me maybe rephrase. So if a child were um, a student of the school and they're one, or one of these clinics in the school, um, the, child, the child could get mental health services without the parent's permission. I guess I'm thinking of an example of maybe where a, a ch where a parent might already be getting mental health services outside of the um, school and may not want them to participate with somebody else. And I'm just trying to think of scenarios where a parent might not want them to. So I'm trying to understand how that would work. So with the, if they were, and that's, that's also a very good question. If the, um, Behavioral health clinician would, um, when meeting with the child and doing an intake, would determine if they are also if they're seeing an outside provider, um, and would refer that child, encourage that child to see continue with that outside provider. Um, we don't like to duplicate efforts, and so we would encourage them to see that outside provider. Um, if they're um, the student. It, it appears as though the student really needs the care is in crisis, then that mental health provider would communicate with that outside provider and to discuss the case. And, and again, to try to get that student back to that outside provider. And so how would it work if they weren't seeing an outside provider and the parent didn't want them to um, be um, seen by the mental health therapist in the mental health program? If they were, if they were at risk, if there was if there was concern about risk of harm or safety, the provider could see up to six visits. Again, you know that in that case, we'd have to look at what the re rationale is behind why the parent does not want to, you know, have that child seen. If there is an intake, it determines that their the child does need therapy. Then, they would work work really hard to to engage that parent. Um, you have to assess each situation different. 
um, the provider could, after six visits, extend that to six more visits without parental consent. But again, you know, in, in that situation, we'd have to look at the clinician would have to look at the the reason why that parent does not want that care and assess each situation independently. So um, treatment can occur and does occur without the, the parent's permission. Um, up to right. pretty much up to six visits, but beyond that, we usually are very successful. It's been a history and very successful in engaging the parent in that care. And then I don't know if you can answer this. Um, who funds the, the centers within the school? Because this, like I said, we don't have them in our school. I don't know, maybe this isn't the right question for you, or maybe it is. Sure. I've been um, I'm operating school-based health centers are involved since 1993, so I'm an, an old hand okay. here, over 27 years. Um, and it's it, that's a good question. It's a mix of funding. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are 92 school-based health centers that receive some support funding through the State Department of um, Public Health. So it's the state. Um, and back in 1993, the funding that was allocated was sufficient to fully uh, operate the school-based health center. So it would be a medical provider, a mental health provider, and support staff. Um, as time's gone on and operational costs have increased, and, and that is not the case. And, and so the school-based health centers uh, supplement the funding by um, other sources. It could be other grant sources. Um, we do bill for services. So um, we bill for medical services and behavioral health and dental services through Husky, as well as commercial insurances. I know there was a, um, a, uh, a discussion earlier um, about um, bringing services, behavioral health services into a school and with the CARES money. And, um, not being able to support it after the CARES money goes away. And for mental health services, we're pretty successful in being reimbursed for the behavioral health services, both through Husky as well as commercial insurances. And we found um, it's very cost-effective that once the uh, clinicians um, develop a patient panel and do bill Medicaid and, and do private insurances, that is a self-sustaining um, service. Um, medical is a little bit more challenging, but um, it's a it's it's a really a mix of funding. DPH um, funding would help to support uh, seed money, active seed money for these programs to get the programs established. And again, then once the um, the services are established and the students are connected, and I you know say develop a patient panel, then through billing, a mix of other funding, they're self-sustaining. So oh, um, if I understand you right, it's not through the Board of Ed or the municipality, it's on a, from the state and, and some state and a mix of other entities. The school-based health centers um, are run by, uh, throughout the state, the 92 are run by different organizations. It could be a federally qualified health center, it could be a hospital, it could be a Board of Ed, it could be, could be a municipality, it could be a nonprofit. Um, the, the 92, as I said, school-based health centers get some sort of state funding. And the municipality in may contribute some funding, a board of ed may contribute some funding, um, a nonprofit may contribute some funding that really is varies from community to community. Um, and, but it's um, billing is an important part of the sustainability. Okay, thank you. And just one last thing, I'm not sure if you're again, the one to, to, I'm trying to read this bill and understand it. Is this um, something the goal is to mandate that all schools have this in the state of Connecticut? We'd love to have all schools to have a school-based health center in the state of Connecticut. If that's a mandate, I would love it. I'm not sure if, if you know, that's the case. If this bill, you know, is that's what they're, um, that, that they're advocating for. I think that school-based health centers have absolutely do, uh, demonstrated the success in keeping the kids out of the ER, um, quickly responding in a cost-effective way to their medical and behavioral health and oral health issues, um, you know, having the kids compliant and then providing them with the, the, the knowledge and the healthcare practices so that they go on, you know, to be productive adults. And, and one of the other things um, Representative Wielander said, healthy kids make better learners. That's our tagline for the state association. 
um, you know, we truly see that um, academic achievement on and when we're successful in providing those school-based services with the, the students that they, they thrive. And, and we've um, monitored and have data on improving seat time, improving academic performance, both data-wise as well as through anecdotal stories. So thank you so much for your testimony and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Wielander. Hi, how are you, Melanie? Very good. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to follow up quickly on a couple of things. One, um, just wanted to address Representative Dauphine's concern about it being a mandate. It's not a mandate. Um, the idea would be to um, create a plan to try to establish mental health based clinics in areas that do not currently have them alongside with the Department of Public Health in consultation with the Connecticut Association of School Based Health Centers. Um, so we can just sort of see the next step as to making sure we get as many children access to as much care as possible. Um, the other thing I just wanted to touch base on was the idea, because I'm, I'm a parent as well, three school age children, and I wanna make sure that my kids are doing as well as possible um, and be part of that care. But would it be safe to say that oftentimes if children are seeking out care outside of their parents' knowledge or their parents' awareness, it's because this is a moment of crisis. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And so uh, having that option, that availability of, of care immediately available can help prevent um, certain harm to self, harm to others type of, of situations. Yeah. You know, many of the kids that we see that, you know, maybe that the parent is involved in the, in the situation and it, it becomes a, you know, abuse situation or fear situation. And we wouldn't want to have that, that initial parental permission and, you know, be a barrier for them seeking the care that they need. Um, you know, that there are so many different issues and, and our goal and, and working with the school system and with the community is to immediately and accurately assess and then to get those kids out of that crisis situation to keep them out of the ER, you know, for a crisis, but to, to accurately assess and then get them into proper treatment. And we found that, you know, in, in the majority of cases that once we do an intake and we establish that, that relationship with that child, and then we're able to engage the family in, in family therapy. Um, but we start with that individual because it, you know, there's a, the, the challenges of getting kids in into services in the community, and you know, it, there's there's limited providers. There's transportation issues. They don't know where to go. There may not. There may be. There's just so many different issues that uh, you know. Our goal is by being in the schools and into working with the school staff and to be there immediately to identify you know, what's going on with the child, who do we need to be involved? And, and the parent is certainly in the family unit is an important part of, of that care. And, and so we um, don't um, let that, you know, that permission form be the, the one of those barriers, mm -hmm. but we certainly, you know, want the parents to be involved in, in the care and it could be for medical, mental health and, and, and or dental. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's, I wanted just to mention one more thing because I, I'm thinking about this a lot. This is, um, I volunteer with Sandy Hook Promise Organization and you mentioned you, know, you live in Sandy Hook and this is the start of their Say Something Week and which is all about um, identifying certain things and if you see something, say something. There's a lot of different points, but one of their big things is having a trusted adult and being an upstander. And um, it started yesterday and expanding the circle of trusted adults. It's gonna take a minute. To all of our that. children is I think uh, a, a worthy goal um, for, for all of us. And it sounds like this would be a, a helpful way to do that. So um, right, thank you so much for your support and your time today, I should say. And um, I'm, I'm all set, Madam Chair, thank you. I apologize, I accidentally unmuted myself while I was muttering things to my computer. So I sincerely apologize. Um, are there any other questions? Seeing none, you're all set. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to ask uh, Jesse Gleckel, followed by Thomas Nicholas and Jonathan Budd. Jesse, are you with us? I am, thanks. Hey Jesse, thank you for being here today, go ahead. 
Good afternoon. Thanks, Senator Anwar, Representative Linehan, and members of the Committee on Children. Um, thanks for having me back again. Um, it's good to be back with, in front of all of you. Uh, my name is Jesse Gleckel, and I'm the Director of Programs and Standards at the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. As you probably know, the Alliance is the state's leading voice to end sexual violence in coalition of community-based sexual assault crisis service centers. Our mission is to create communities free of sexual violence and to provide culturally affirming, trauma-informed advocacy, prevention, and intervention services centered on the voices of survivors. Today, I'd like to speak on House Bill 5698, an act concerning the collection and reporting of adverse childhood experiences data, a theme for me, the data. As I shared during a previous testimony prior to coming to the Alliance, I spent eight years at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention working in violence prevention and on large scale efforts to collect and respond to data on childhood experiences of violence. Um, the Alliance supports the systematic collection of adverse childhood experiences data or ACEs. There are clearly documented links to the experiences of trauma in childhood and negative social and health outcomes in later childhood, adolescence and adulthood particularly when those trauma are left unaddressed. Studying and understanding adverse childhood experiences is critical for adequately preventing and responding to traumatic childhood experiences such as sexual violence in order to help increase the possibility of healthier life trajectories. For the Alliance and our member centers, having ACEs data aids us in our work to increase capacity of partners in other sectors, such as healthcare, to understand the impacts of trauma on survivors' physical and mental health, and to use that information to appropriately respond to survivors' needs. We also use ACEs data to, in efforts to support the long-term health and well-being of survivors throughout the state. So as written, this bill and its requirement of local and regional boards of education, the State Department of Education, and the Office of Early Childhood to collect and report data concerning adverse childhood experiences. Um, the bill does not clearly describe what will happen with the data once collected, uh, nor does the bill describe what other critical sectors will be involved in identifying appropriate action based on the data. However, I have seen um, a testimony from Commissioner Bai just, just recently from the Office of um, Ch Early Childhood. Um, and I was excited to see that she does have a bunch of information in there around data to action and the use of evidence-based uh, programs. So that's really exciting. Um, but prior to the passage of this bill, we think critical, uh, critical to clarify how these efforts will align with future efforts by the Department of Public Health, um, which I think uh, Commissioner Bai does talk about in her testimony, how um, SDE will be held accountable for using these data for children's and the broader public's health, and how SDE will engage with other sectors such as public health and social and crisis service providers in responding to these data. Um, and lastly, just based on the public health impacts that have been demonstrated through the original ACE study of the, 19, of the late 1990s, it remains imperative that adverse childhood experiences data be analyzed and acted on through multi-sectoral approaches, and that these approaches include evidence-informed prevention and response programming. Thank you so much. Can you please sum up in two or three seconds? Perfect, thank you. <laughs> Look at that, perfect timing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Um, there, you know, as we stated from the beginning, this bill kind of, the language you're seeing today is a jumping off point. I think there's a lot of work to be done on it, especially um, that it's not a committee bill. So, um, so we're almost as new to it as everybody else. So we're kind of working things out. I do look forward to speaking to Commissioner Bai. Um, I know that Liza Andrews had sent me some questions. We have responses to those that we'll be sending over. Um, and just making sure that kind of um, I's are dotted and T's are crossed, but your written testimony is, is instrumental to us making sure that this bill is done correctly. So I really can't thank you enough for that. And I'm sure we'll be reaching out too. Uh, are, there, are there any questions from members of the committee? Okay, seeing none, we have none now, but like I said, I'm confident that we'll be in touch soon. My pleasure to, to be in contact with you all as well. Great, thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Thomas Nicholas followed by Jonathan Budd and Wayne Moss. Thomas, hi, are you with us today? Yes, I am. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So good afternoon, Representative Lanahan. Um, Senator Saud, uh, Senator Martin, and Representative Delfinios, uh, and distinguished members of the Committee of Children. The Connecticut Education Association, of which I'm vice president of, is an organization representing active and retired teachers from over 150 districts across Connecticut. There is a dire 
mental health crisis affecting children in Connecticut and across the country. This is a crisis that is driven by a growing number of our youngest students who have experienced trauma, adverse childhood experiences. Rates of anxiety and depression and suicide are rising rapidly among adolescents, regardless of their race, their ethnicity, or their family income. CEA's members see this impact of the adverse childhood experiences in their classrooms, most disturbingly in the earliest grades. In some instances, um, they see it in children's disengagement. In other instances, we see it in students' inability to regulate their stresses and emotions. They see it, we see it in aggressive, disruptive, and even violent outbursts that have been causing significant physical and emotional harm to others around them. Students, teachers, and others in the school community are affected as well. Educators also see manifestations of trauma and depression and alienation. As Education Week recently reported, 35% of children 14 to 18 years old have a mental health crisis every year, which includes self-injury, suicide, and attempted to suicide. The most terrifying aspect of these statistics is that they are from prior to the pandemic. School closures, lack of socialization, um, disruptions to our normal routines, food insecurity, um, decreased access to school services can only have exacerbating effects on the mental health mm -hmm. crisis. Children will return to school behind academically, but most troubling is the fact that they will be in desperate need of support and mental health resources. Schools have long lacked. The bills being heard today intend to address these uh, concerns and we applaud the committee for their raising them for a public hearing. CEA supports House Bill 6509 and Senate Bill 934. Instituting school-based mental health clinics. Mr. Nichols? Yes. Thank, thank you for your testimony. If you can sum up in two or three sentences. Sure. Um, CEA also supports uh, the concept of 5698, but not as drafted um, as you spoke to earlier in this meeting for those concerns. Um, so I thank you for your time and be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Nicholas. I sincerely appreciate uh, your testimony. It's actually going to be very useful. Um, could you also provide written testimony? Yes. Okay. And in that written testimony, do you give suggestions on um, how to draft 5698 from your perspective? Um, I wouldn't so much as say suggestions, but the areas of concern. Um, That's helpful. Yeah. Very, very helpful. So what we're going to do, um, I, I know that we have a lot of work to do on this bill to make sure that we are really doing what we what we intend to do without any unintended consequences. So um, we will continue to look at that. And if it's all right with you, I'd like to reach out to you if, if I need more input from your organization. Sure, absolutely. I was a big Great. proponent of ACEs several years ago, um, but it's the privacy aspects that are most concerning to us. Right, and we, you know, from um, from the research that um, that we have done since looking at this bill, um, I have gotten some information that, of course, it's going to be any information is also subject uh, to FERPA, so um, that's that's an important thing to note. Um, do you have knowing that it's um, that there are uh, FERPA and FOI restrictions? Does that help or do you think it needs to go further than that? Um, it might need to go further. Um, I mean, I believe the information is de-identified. Isn't that correct? In, in the normal collection of the data? Yes, it should be. It should so if be. it remains de-identified throughout the whole process, um, would that answer some of your concerns? It would, it would. Okay. 
we want to make sure, you know, we've had some, some people reach out like, okay, so if we're talking about early childhood, um, first of all, you know, if we're going prior to kindergarten, does FERPA still um, count? Is it, does it still apply? I don't know. We're finding out. Also, um, you know, are people going to be concerned that if they're honest on these questionnaires, which is what we want, um, that will suddenly open up a DCF matter. You know, we don't necessarily want people to think that that's going to happen either. So there are some hurdles that we have to overcome um, for this legislation. And I want you to know that we are really focused on, on trying to do that. We, I, I can say um, as a co-chair of the committee, I don't want to pass out anything um, that isn't ready for prime time. So we will continue to do work for this. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much, sir. And I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you. Have a good You're day, welcome. everybody. You as well. Okay, we are asking for Jonathan Budd, followed by Wayne Moss and Trish Sylvia. Jonathan, hi, how are you today? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Representative Linehan, Senator Anwar, and members of the Committee on Children. As superintendent of the Wood Bridge School District, I speak in support of proposed Bill 934, an act requiring the provision of information concerning mental and emotional health resources by school districts. As a 25-year educator, I cannot emphasize enough that children's mental and emotional health needs are foundational to children's success in school. With today's world presenting so much that is unsettled and concerning to all of us, it's no wonder that our children, too, may be unsettled and concerned. Uh, jostled out of their predictable routines in March of 2020, for the past year, our children have endured uncertainty about some incredibly basic questions, including how and when they and their caregivers can be healthy and safe in this pandemic world. As our children return to school more fully, the health of their minds and their emotions is not supplemental to their success, but rather vital to their success. Educational philosopher Maxine Green put it simply, I am what I am not yet. To help our children fully actualize their innate potential, we as educators must endorse methods to ensure that all children's families have at their fingertips the resources to support us in educating each child fully, turning from the current difficult times toward a future filled with possibility. Proposed Bill 934 will prioritize for each local district the necessity of compiling, publicizing and annually updating mental and emotional health resources available for the district students. That process at the local level should dovetail nicely with other important local efforts to analyze and if necessary improve mental and emotional health resources relevant for the district's particular student needs. In addition, the bill's language requiring annual updating of resource lists will reinforce the understanding that strong mental and emotional health are not necessary only at times of crisis, but always. I want to end by thanking you for your interest in supporting school superintendents and bettering our children's lives. Our ongoing work together embodies the principle of President Kennedy, who said, children are the living messages we send to a time we will not see. Thank you very much. Oh man, quote JFK, you got me. Thank you so very much um, for your testimony. I appreciate you being here. I, I, so often we hear, um, stop having schools do more. And here we have a superintendent who says, this is the more we should be doing. Uh, I appreciate you so much for that. Um, I don't know if you've ever followed this committee, sir, uh, but I'm a big believer in giving information to parents. If we empower parents to make better choices for their kids, they're going to do it, right? So I, I am so thankful that you're on board with this. I just have a quick question. Um, I love this bill. This bill has my vote. I, I think that this is phenomenal. It's easy, it's cheap, and it's smart. But I think one thing that we 
can do to make it even better is to require this information to be in more places than just on the website. If we were going to amend this with substitute language, where do you think we should also include, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, I'm sorry. Where do you think we should also include this language for parents to be able to see outside of just the school website? That's a great question. And I appreciate your compliments. I don't know that you know, Representative, that I'm your constituent, as well as being a member of the <laughs> of your public here. So uh, as a resident of Cheshire, thank you Dad, for your I'm service. I'm talking to you. <laughs> yeah, but sorry about that. Go ahead. I think, I think that I'd like to uh, get back to you with an answer on that. Actually, I think two years ago, I'm not sure if it went through this committee, but the legislature um, ultimately approved a bill related to information on domestic violence and domestic abuse and our provision of uh, resources to uh, parents who withdraw their children from school, recognizing that that's a pipeline uh, toward in uh, relation to those areas. So I'd like to look back at that uh, that bill and perhaps get back to you with a suggestion on, I think it's a good idea, other, other forums where this could be helpful. Yeah, please do. And I appreciate you talking about that bill. That was my bill. And, um, and that also came from um, a superintendent from Southington. So there are many of you out there that are speaking up saying more information is necessary. Um, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Representative Wielander um, because uh, we definitely want to make this as strong a bill as possible. So thank you so very much. And with You're that, welcome. we have uh, Representative Wielander ready to ask you some questions too, sir. Hi, Dr. Butt, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I just actually just want to follow up, just wanted to um, thank you for your time being here. And also just to, one of the concerns that I was looking at when looking at these bills was um, the budget line item and how that affects our schools and how everything that we're, you know, schools are being asked to do um, more with less constantly. I know that's a phrase that many schools are facing right now, um, especially during budget season. And I just wanted to um, ask your opinion as to whether or not this was, you felt like this would be an effective way to get this information across without um, putting a, a, a burden on the school district, but still making sure that the information is available for families and for, for teachers and, and the school communities at large. I would say the burden of this bill for any district who's doing what's right for kids should be totally de minimis. And I would say that the value is incalculable in terms of the children's lives who could be positively affected. Uh, there's all sorts of other bills, some of which have become laws where the burden is not de minimis. But in this case, it absolutely simply records the great work that should be being done in every local district. And this bill, if made law, would rise uh, to that to the highest level in each district. Absolutely worth it. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that feedback. And uh, I as echo um, my chairwoman that um, I would love to hear an, any feedback about making this information more accessible, you know, especially going offline if possible. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, Dr. Bud, you're off the hook, but thank you so very much. Thank I appreciate you, you and I look forward to talking with you soon. Take care. Bye, everyone. You too. Uh, next, we please have Wayne Moss, followed by Trish Sylvia and Lori Collins. Hi, Wayne. Are you with us? I am with you. Thank you so much for Wayne. having me. Yeah, Thank so you for I, being here. Go ahead. Yeah, I should have come with my uh, JFK quotes. Uh, if I'd have known that, <laughs> hey, next time I'll bring it. So uh, first of all, to, uh, to Chair Lenahan and Chair Anwar and the members of the Selection Committee on Children, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, chat, speak with you all today. I definitely want to acknowledge you all and applaud you all for the commitment you all have uh, in the area of, of youth safety. So again, I'm Wayne Moss, I serve as the executive director for uh, the National Council of Youth Sports. And I'm here today to actually give you the council's perspective on House Bill uh, 6511. So first of all, I just wanna say up front that uh, NCYS, the National Council of Youth Sport has no financial stake in, in this bill at all. 
you know, we simply our our interest really is simply ensuring that the uh, the young people uh, in Connecticut uh, are are properly protected. And so uh, we've worked tirelessly uh, around uh, child protection, and uh, wanted to give you all some uh, perspective about that. So first of all, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, background as to you know who the National Council of Youth Sports is. We are a nonprofit that represents uh, some of the who's who in the youth sports industry. So uh, our membership ranges from national uh, national community based organizations like you know Pop Warner and Little League Boys and Girls Clubs. Those are all organizations that operate inside of uh, your communities. Um, you know, we also have national governing bodies like USA uh, Basketball and USA Field Hockey. And, you know, our membership represents some 60 million young people registered uh, in organized sports. And so uh, we've got an independent board, uh, again, uh, so uh, are guided by that. Um, it's all based on our members. Uh, and so I wanted to give you a little bit of background as to who we are first and foremost. You know, back in 2002, we actually were uh, at the urging of our members, we were involved in focusing our efforts around uh, criminal background screenings. And so we took a lot of time to solicit uh, advice and gather uh, best practices. And we worked with the FBI. We got named inside of uh, the Federal Protect Act, which uh, was a, an important piece of legislation. Uh, designed to prevent sexual exploitation of, of young people. And since that time, we've created um, recommended guidelines for background screenings uh, for youth sport organizations. And those have quite frankly become industry, uh, industry uh, standards. The concern that we have with uh, House Bill 6511 is that this has the potential to really create two separate uh, standards of care, if you will. And so uh, we applaud uh, certainly all that you all are doing. Uh, we cer certainly- Mr. Uh, Miles, yes. thank you for your time allotted is up. If you can summarize in two or three sentences, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So essentially we'd love to work with you around uh, ensuring that uh, the provisions uh, that we worked on through the years that we've endorsed and that uh, other organizations have adopted, uh, serving millions of young people, uh, that those uh, standards get uh, adopted in terms of the legislation uh, that you all are putting forth. So thank you for your time. Appreciate you, appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Moss. I appreciate you being here today. I do have some questions for you. Um, yeah. I noticed that you had contacted um, some of the uh, co-sponsors of this legislation. And so this brought up some concerns that I had on my end, which I believe that I voiced not only to your organization, uh, but also at the beginning of this public hearing today. So I just, in order to get this out of the way so that we can have a conversation about the substance of the bill, I do need to ask you some questions about your organization. Sure. Uh, first of all, do you charge for a membership to your organization? We are a membership organization. Uh, we have member fees that, that are associated with it, yes. Okay, great. And um, and I saw that on um, some of the information that you gave to um, some of the co-sponsors of this legislation, that it says that you provide a background check service. Um, and is that an additional fee beyond your membership fee? We do not provide background screening services uh, at the National Council of Youth Sports. Uh, again, that's how it looked on your on your flyer. So that's not the case. Yeah, we do not provide background screenings. Okay. Do you work with companies that do provide these background screenings for your members to go out and yeah, get them? So, yeah, so we do a couple of things. So first of all, we've identified uh, standards that background screening should uh, adhere to. Uh, we have endorsed uh, an organization, the, uh, the National Center for Safety Initiatives, as being an organization that does an extraordinary job uh, with background screenings. So here's a question. So um, essentially you're saying that our bill doesn't go far enough. You think it should be stronger? Yeah. Well, Is that correct? 
Yeah, we we believe that uh, we certainly would simply like to ensure that the uh, the strength of the bill is the solid and that there's not duplicity in uh, you know in the market with organizations thinking they need to do one thing here and then another thing there. So yes, we'd like to strengthen, help you all strengthen the bill. Okay, so I understand that you want um, this bill to be in line with your standards. Are there currently Connecticut organizations um, who are um, part of your membership? There are organizations, national organizations that touch down locally in uh, Connecticut, including uh, Pop Warner, AAU, Boys and Girls Clubs, to give you uh, some examples. Okay, and in order to be a member of your um, of your organization, are you required to follow those background check guidelines? Organizations are not required to follow the guidelines. We simply provide them because we believe they to be best in class. Uh, organizations have the ability to, uh, you know, to adhere to those or, or not. So, so my question to you is then, if it is not required in state law, and if it's not required to be a member, then how would our bill, which, and I'll explain why this is important after, how would our bill, which you feel doesn't go far enough, then say, somehow be problematic to organizations which are part of your membership that aren't required to um, have a certain background check for your membership and aren't required currently under state law, how could passing this at all be a bad thing? Well, so the, uh, the organizations uh, that are part of the, uh, the NCYS membership, you know, quite frankly, many of them have adopted those guidelines. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a requirement of membership uh, they see the, uh, the benefit and have adopted those. And so, you know, we've got uh, n uh, hundreds of organizations that have adopted those guidelines and they are serving millions of young people across the country. Uh, and so, again, these are at, uh, at governing body levels, uh, whether that is national governing bodies or community-based. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's the benefit that those organizations see as they push down those requirements downstream. Right. I, I, you know, I um, completely understand um, wanting to go stronger. Um, I, I, if you ask anyone who knows me, I practically wrote the idea, wrote the book on that. You know, I, I always, when it comes to the safety of kids, especially when we're talking about um, regarding child sex abuse, this is of extreme importance to me. But I, I think because you're not a Connecticut organization per se, you may not have understood the background of what this bill is and why, um, why it is how it is. Uh, we have been uh, working towards um, really a really strong background check procedure for camps uh, and municipal camps um, and sports for a long time. And there's always been some pushback. And so um, we haven't been able to get it across the finish line, which I think is a very sad state of affairs. And we could spend an hour here today talking why I think it's truly disgusting that someone wouldn't support um, ensuring that someone is um, safe to be around children. Uh, but it turns out it's a money issue. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't want to put small businesses out of business. We don't want to... Um, cost organizations money in order to do um, these really comprehensive background checks. Here sometimes uh, in the legislature, we have to do baby steps. It, it's a very difficult lesson for me to learn because I don't believe in baby steps. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I am full boat all the time. However, in order to actually get something into statute, sometimes that's what we need to do. So my concern then is, I'm wondering if you would like to kind of amend your testimony, knowing that um, we do have a, an inability to get things over the line here in Connecticut. So would you agree that passing something like it is written in this bill as a first step, noting that we are working as compromised language uh, so that all of the interested parties are on board and that this could pass to at least get 
something so that we have some sort of safety net for these kids. Isn't that better than nixing a bill because you don't think it's strong enough? Yeah, what I would say about that is there are a number of organizations. I want to make sure that I am clear. Uh, there are a number of organizations, particularly on the, uh, the United States Olympic and Paralympic uh, Committee side of the house for which the standards that we drafted and they actually, uh, they drafted off of those, uh, those are requirements for uh, those member organizations. So there are some uh, 50 national governing bodies that make up uh, the USOPC. And for those organizations, they are in fact uh, accountable to, you know, to fulfill and maintain uh, those standards. Uh, those standards of care uh, cut across uh, many uh, communities, inc including, you know, the state of Connecticut. And so, you know, again, what you will find is that if there are, you know, there's the potential for there to be two standards of care uh, in the state of Connecticut and you know, I don't think that you all want to be in a position where uh, organizations are really unclear about what the appropriate guidance should be. Right. And I understand where you're going with that. But let me be very clear. Then it becomes our law that we pass would become the minimum standard. Mm -hmm. And then to be a member of those organizations that require a higher standard, then those members need to fulfill those requirements. I don't believe there would be any confusion. There is a state requirement and then there's a membership organization requirement. And I think that one can be stronger than the other. And I also think that your organization's requirements or the USOC's requirements could be our next step moving forward on that. But I certainly don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that we shouldn't be doing this bill because of confusion of standards. I don't think there will be any confusion because right now there are no standards. So that's, so that's what we're really trying to, to get at here. Um, and I, I really do uh, you know, take issue with the idea that we, can, we can't do anything unless it matches organizational standards. I don't think that's appropriate. I think that it, the time has come for us to do something. And, um, and so you know, keep in mind that we're not just talking about you know, the Connecticut arm of USA Swimming or USA Gymnastics, two um, Olympic organizations that were um, marred by recent scandals. So we're not trying to say, and then this bill would not say, this law would not say that it supersedes anything in, um, beyond that organization. But what about the mom and pop coaching staff of a local um, municipal softball team. I mean, let me give you a for example. Um, and I've said this in this committee multiple times, and this is one of the reasons why this bill is so important to me. My daughter was asked very, very, very inappropriate questions by an adult who was her um, umpire as she was catching the championship softball game. And she told her coaches and her coaches did nothing. And so what my 10 year old child had to do in the middle of the championship game was throw down her glove and scream at the top of her lungs, I don't feel safe. Now, this is, uh, uh, these umpires are members of a national organization, but we didn't have a state law to require a background check. So it is extremely important that we have information and laws that support the need for background checks, that require background checks any more than we have today, which is none. And if someday we can take those incremental steps as people will realize how important this is to get up to a higher standard, I'm all for it. But I have to mention to you and to everyone listening and to every person on this committee, we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater and fail to pass a bill because we don't think that they're strong enough when we've tried for years to pass out bills that are even stronger. This is compromised language and it is very, very important. Do yes. you have any response to that before we move on to my co-chair, Senator Anwar? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I certainly can appreciate that. And uh, you know, I, I empathize with you on a number of fronts. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say that behavior is despicable. I wanna make sure that you know, we go on record with that. 
And please know that, you know, we're certainly open to, uh, you know, to, to working with you all around the language uh, on this bill. Again, our interest is simply ensuring that, you know, several things, uh, you know, happen or don't happen, you know, again, we want to ensure that there's not unintended consequences of organizations paying twice, uh, you know, that, uh, again, we want to make sure that uh, this process really works well for you all. It works well for, you know, for those organizations and that uh, there's not confusion and or, uh, you know, other challenges. But again, we'll say to you that we're certainly open to, you know, working with you around the language of the bill. Great. Thank you very much. And, and just to say um, real quickly that, and I said this in my email back to um, your organization member, we, you know, I recognize that you don't want people to have to pay twice, but under state law, we are not requiring them to pay for background checks that are um, at your level. State law requ will require that they do background checks at our level, and it will be then their choice if they want to remain a member of your organization to or any organization to um, to get to the higher standard of background checks. And perhaps those organizations that um, that conduct those background checks uh, for money can amend their pricing, knowing that they won't have to check as many places. Um, because Connecticut state law has already given some of that information. So that's just something important uh, to note. And I do look forward to working with you moving on. Um, are there any questions from any other member of the committee? Unfortunately, Senator Anwar is not available to ask any questions right now. So I think that that about does it. Thank you very much, Mr. Moss. We appreciate your time. Thank you. I do appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me today. Sure, have a great day. You too. Uh, next, we have Trish Sylvia, followed by Lori Collins and Stacey Schleet. Do we have Trish? I'm sorry, it seems that we don't have uh, Trish with us. We will give her a check mark. And if she's able to come on board, we will talk to her again. Uh, Lori Collins, are you here? I am. Hi, Lori, how are you? Thank you for being here today. Hi, good, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the members of the Children's Committee for hearing the testimony today. My name is Lori Collins and I'm the Association Director for the Connecticut Association of School-Based Health Centers. Um, and I am indeed testifying in support of Raised Bill 6509, an act concerning school-based mental health clinics. Um, you heard from uh, Melanie Bonjour earlier, uh, who is our association president, and I know that she, she may have said some of these things, so I'm going to go through them really quickly and hope I don't get uh, the hook for the three minutes, but uh, I wanted to tell you about the school-based health centers. Uh, they serve about 27 communities across the state, and as Melanie alluded to, they are the main point of contact for over 40,000 children to obtain medical, mental health, and some dental care. So for a lot of students across Connecticut, um, that really is a lifeline for them. And in terms of mental health, that is the place that these children go where they can connect um, with a person who is a trusted adult that they can um, you know, create a good relationship with where they can trust them and, and, and be able to talk to them and feel very supported in the struggles that they are having. Um, being able to connect with a licensed professional at a school-based health center uh, right on site at a school um, definitely has changed the trajectory of many students' lives, uh, those definitely who are struggling with mental health uh, issues like anxiety and depression. Um, I really want to thank Sarah Egan, who was spoke earlier too, who so articulately talked about the staggering statistics which on mental health in Connecticut. Um, you know, we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has taken a huge toll on all of our mental health, um, but none more than the kids. Um, you know, children have spent an entire year of upheaval and change uh, dealing with sickness and death of family members and social isolation. So I wanted to share with you um, just a, a few lines that one of the school-based health center directors uh, shared with me from one of the students, and she wanted to remain anonymous, but here's what she said. She sent this to her clinician. She said, good morning. 
I'm writing this email out of appreciation to you. During this summer and school, there have been instances that bad things could have happened to me, but you have been there to help me through it. You have shown me how to look at the bright side of things and not necessarily look at the bad. I've had some bad days and some good days, but you have taught me that I am not alone in anything that I have to go through. Without you, I probably would not be doing so good and still strive to reach my goals. I just want you to know that even though I may talk a lot or repeat things a lot to you, I appreciate you and all that you have done for me. Uh, I think that's a pretty profound statement from a student. Um, and I think the things that really stuck out for me was the connection that uh, she obviously shared with, with this uh, provider um, and feeling not alone is so important. Thank you for your... <laughs> Can you sum up in your three sentences, your testimony, please? No problem. Um, what I want to really hit home here is uh, the, the association strongly supports the bill and also strongly supports the comprehensive model of integrated mental health and medical care for children. Um, and that is something that I'm sure you will hear more about in later testimony, but it is key to be able to um, have early identification of issues that show up through physical um, ailments and may be related to a more mental health um, issue. So being able to refer between and get immediate consultation between the two services in the school-based health center integrated model is key. Um, so I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, we strongly support the bill and uh, we hope that we see more mental health services available uh, in the coming, coming months. Thank you very much, Ms. Collins. I, I greatly appreciate your testimony. Um, and I know that your student wished to remain anonymous and will obviously honor that anonymity. Um, however, uh, we do have um, here in the committee, we actually, whenever a student comes to testify on legislation that would affect them, uh, we provide them with a very special letter and pin um, to thank them for being involved. So if you wouldn't mind emailing uh, myself or Representative Wielander, um, and we can provide that information, keeping it anonymous, you could just give us something to send, uh, you could give us an address to send it to, and we'll send it to you. And then you can give that to the student along with a letter of our thanks. That would be great, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Are there any questions? Representative Comey. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, hi, Lori, good to see you virtually. Okay. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you would be able to share with us some of the, um, the unique ways that you are um, um, supporting children with mental health uh, needs in the schools, being that it's a pandemic Pandemic and there's so, you know, we're just all over the place as far as, you know, students actually being in school and some of the districts must, it must be so different in all your different districts across the state. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you have some unique models that you're using. Um, so I, what I will say is you are right about the, the uniqueness of all, all of the different um, organizations who are providing the supports. Um, we recently did a survey to find out what kind of innovations uh, the school-based health centers were doing so we could capture that all and have a story to tell. So I could tell you some of them. Um, you know, uh, probably, you know, so the easy ones are the administrative changes uh, right away, you know, the school-based health centers figured out that the kids weren't on site. So they needed to have different hours of operation and things like that. So, you know, human resource-wide schedule changes and uh, staff were really flexible about when they would connect with kids. Um, the main way that they started to connect with the students almost right away when the pandemic began was through telehealth services. And um, that came with a lot of its own challenges, as you can imagine, you know, figuring out how to how to use the technology for the kids, making sure people had broadband and all of that. But um, that was a big one. And that has remained a, a really um, a huge relief for a lot of people to be able to connect and make sure we, we are able to reach the kids who may have fallen through the cracks. So that was a big one. Um, some of the things that sort of bigger that happened were some of the districts. Um, one, for sure, I know uh, Melanie's district um, pulled together drive-through immunization clinics 
to make sure that kids were compliant with their state immunization schedules to be able to go back to school. So they, they were opened up over the summer and um, had you know, the regular immunizations available through a drive up. And we've had a lot of um, stories about really aggressive outreach that probably wouldn't have needed to happen. Melanie talked a lot about being able to, you know, in the traditional model, being able to reach the kids right there on site uh, when the school was open. And when you can't do that, um, outreach was really, really important. And so, you know, reaching out to the kids. I know that some of the districts even started helping with contact tracing. Uh, the school-based health centers were really partnering um, to make sure that that happened in a, in a great way. And, and um the biggest, likely, the biggest help was uh, being able to do rapid testing. So a lot of the school-based health centers was, were doing the rapid testing and still are. So there's been lots of activity. That's fantastic. And, and um, I'm glad to hear that because actually out of those through four or five you listed, I've actually had been able, for, my family has been uh, fortunate to be able to take advantage of two of them. You guys, you folks reached out to me, our local school-based health center to make sure um, that, that if my son had not uh, received his, his flu shot yet, that he, he would be able to get that at school um, because so many kids these days are not going, you know, are, are not being brought to the doctor or sort of on a regular basis for fear of COVID. Um, and then, you know, with, with, the, with our whole topic of discussion on the mental health, I mean, um, you know, my daughter wanted someone to talk to and I had a really, really hard time finding a clinician that was available and that would respond to emails. And when I called, called um, when, I, when I reached out to the school-based health center, within two days, she was talking to someone telehealth and she's still, still using that service. So. Thank you for your work. You're, you're making my life and you know, easier and better. And um, I look forward to, to working with you more. Thank you, Lori. Great, thank you. Representative Comey, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with school-based health centers. The, um, it really you know, drives home a point. I, I, I always say this because I went through the, the same thing, um, that legislators tend to know where the help is. And, um, and if we, in, with our connections, can't find help for our kids, just imagine how difficult it is for our children of parents who aren't connected to um, state departments and liaisons and other legislators, and um, especially those in rural areas. And I think yeah. that that's really important. So thank you, Representative, um, for, for giving us that information. Are there any other questions from Ms. Collins? Seeing none, thank you very much, Ms. Collins. We appreciate your time. Thank you. We have Stacy Schlieb. Stacy, are you here with us? I don't see you. So we will hold that open for you if you are able to come back. Uh, we have, next we have, please, Catherine Irwin, followed by Greta Wagner and then Nicole Paquette. Catherine, are you with us? I am. <laughs> thank Hi you. There. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, this is way easier than a couple of years ago when I was in Hartford and waiting and waiting and watching the we time. You wait. So this is kind of nice. No, this is good. I just did my dishes. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. Um, I am. I am testifying today um, uh, in support of Bill Number Sixty Five Zero Seven, the Act concerning maternal choice in the event of a stillbirth and the removal of delivered placenta from the hospital. Um, I am the mother of a stillborn daughter. I went into spontaneous labor on July 18th, 2015, um, and was told after arriving at the hospital, my, my daughter had passed. I spent six hours laboring on a morphine drip, knowing that our baby had passed away. During that time, we were visited by several doctors and nurses who spoke to us about a variety of postpartum options regarding our daughter. Um, they asked us if we wanted to hold her. They asked us if we wanted pictures. They asked us if we had a name for her. They also asked us if we wanted, uh, what we wanted to do with her remains. Between the pain of labor um, and the emotional pain of knowing that our world had crashed uh, in, uh, we were asked to make a decision to what to do with our daughter's remains <coughs> while I was laboring. Um, it was not appropriate and in hindsight became even more horrific than we could have imagined. 
uh, 41 minutes after delivering our daughter, I was given authorization forms to sign. I was still hooked up to a morphine drip. Um, I couldn't even see the words that I was signing on the paper. Flash forward, uh, sorry. So we left the hospital um, verbally, uh, understanding that our daughter would be cremated. And as the physician had told us, she would be um, disposed of with the rest of the medical waste. Um, flash forward a year and a half later, I needed to get a death certificate um, and uh, found out that our daughter had been in fact buried uh, less than five miles from my home uh, under a number in a field uh, where there were hundreds, if not thousands of more babies who were left. We found our daughter buried under two inches of grass under the number 487. I will remind you that this was in the year 2015 in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, from that day forward, I had to do something. Um, I'm an educator, I'm a mother of living children as well as my daughter, Scarlett. We started our own nonprofit, which provides something called a cuddle cot to hospitals in New England. Um, when I started the nonprofit, most hospitals in Connecticut did not have a um, a cuddle cot, and I'm happy to say that with my help, as well as many other mothers who have gone through this, uh, we have pretty much filled all hospitals in the state of Connecticut. I am talking, speaking in behalf of uh, supporting this bill, specifically in regards to the time in which a parent is given to make the decision for their child's remains, as well as if they choose to remove the placenta from the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. I, I apologize. Uh, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> I get it. I got, I got two sentences. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have been working um, with first Senator Susio starting in 2018, and now Representative Wielinder, um, who is ha um, very fortunate to have brought up uh, this again, as well as Representative, I'm sorry if I'm going to mispronounce your name, but uh, Daphne, um, uh, and in hopes that we can push forward a bill that would give parents uh, the only thing that you want in, in a stillbirth, which is time to make decisions based upon uh, your child's remains. And um, so thank you very much for the time to be able to speak to you all. Thank you very much, Ms. Irwin. Thank you for sharing your story. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Um, and I am extremely um, touched by the fact that you've used this um, to make sure that no one else is going to go through this. I, I was a member of the committee uh, when the bill was first brought up. I was supportive then. Um, and uh, now, like you said, we had the um, additional part from Rep. Dauphinase about um, you know, the second half of, of the bill about the placenta. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're okay with those two things. Uh, being together because we're talking about maternal choice. Um, and, and so uh, I appreciate that greatly. I have but one question. Can you please tell me what a cuddle cot is? Yes, thank you for asking. So um, a cuddle cot is actually manufactured in, in England. Um, they um, are humidified bassinets uh, that allow for in-room time with your child. Uh, nature is not kind. And so within a few hours, a uh, stillborn baby is not um, something that feels good to a parent, a grandparent, a sibling. So a cuddle cot allows, it's almost like an in-room morgue. Um, so it allows time for parents uh, to have time with their parent, uh, babies. Um, I, know, I know parents who have birth, um, sorry, bathed and dressed their babies. Uh, again, inviting grandparents in to say, their um, goodbyes. They, it was actually featured on an NBC episode of some medical drama. And I've been in touch with Chrissy Teigen, who's a famous celebrity who has recently lost her child and um, trying to, uh, again, just spread the word because I understand the, the my brother is a hospital administrator and not in Connecticut. I understand that hospital administrators need turnover. They need a bed, it's a business. So allowing that time to be able to have with your child before leaving and never seeing them again um, is, is so important. So a cuddle cot allows for that to happen. Thank you so much. That's sure. really great. Yeah. Um, 
And I know I only said I had one question, but now it's uh, coming up to me again. I, if you would just bear with me for a moment, because I'm not sure. Um, I want to look up um, the bill number. Do you have the bill number in front of you? Oh, here we are, 6507. I just want to look up real quick while I have you here, because um, a few years ago when we first raised this bill, there was, um, there were some pieces of testimony um, that were actually against it. Um, and at this point, uh, from the hospital association, I believe. And yes. um, I just want you to know that they did not put in any testimony this year for or against the legislation. So my guess is um, that they're remaining neutral. And if they're not, then we will um, hear about that. Uh, and so, um, I do see that there's other pieces um, of testimony and I'll be reviewing those prior to sending the bill out of committee. But um, I just, I thank you very, very much for being here to tell your story. And, and I know that we do have some questions for you if, yeah. if you're up to answering them. Sure, and thank you for the, the platform to be able to, to talk about it and advocate for other parents. So thank you. Absolutely. Representative Dauphine. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much, Catherine, for your testimony. Um, you know, uh, we got your email, obviously, and we um, wanted to um, put this bill up, and we're glad that you're here today to talk about it. You thank said you. that um, one of the things that you were looking for was time, but after listening to your testimony, would you want it to also perhaps address um, the options that you would have with regard to um, the remains, because you you mentioned that later you found out that the remains were put in a in a cemetery and you had no idea. It seems like that would be something you'd want to know as a parent. Um, perhaps you'd want to go visit or or whatever. And I, I that seemed a little bit um, kind of important. So is that something that you would also like to see written in there that you would want the the parent or the parents to be informed of, of exactly what those options were in terms of where the remains were going? Yes, um, and thank you for letting me speak on that. I had to skip through a couple of things of my written, but um, so uh, one, of the, um, one of the missteps that happened in my case was that I was never given discharge papers that actually told me where my daughter would end up. So a lot of um, what happened in my situation was verbal, um, but, upon arriving to the cemetery and seeing the numbers, uh, literally numbers on a disc of how many babies had been left. Um, uh, it, it, I understand that there's going to be times in which parents just can't handle it and they wanna leave, but I can't imagine that the majority of the parents who experience this kind of grief would want that. So in terms of um, time, uh, I, I have con some concerns regarding um, the, the language of how much time is given, because in my case, if it's up to 24 hours, in my case, they would be considered within those, the, those parameters because I was given 41 minutes. So um, I would like there to be some kind of language that either in working with the Connecticut Hospital Association in either discussing you know prior to discharge. So if you have a vaginal birth, uh, you know, most women are given at least 24 hours in a, in a hospital. Um, it could be shortened. And, but it, so, so something along the lines of a, a prior to discharge, having those discussions. Um, in addition to the time to be able to be presented these forms and clearly understand what's going on, um, that continuation of care is also really important. Um, so in my case, you know, parent, if you have a stillbirth, that baby doesn't just you know, it's not an, it's, it's, it's still a natural birth or a cesarean or whoever. So you could be laboring for 36 hours, you know, it just because that baby is not going to be viable when, when she, he or she is born. So um, having the language um, and the continuation of care. So if my, if my, you know, unfortunately, again, in my situation, it was an a, a OB who was in charge of asking me if I wanted to hold my daughter, if I wanted to, um, you know, bathe my daughter. Um, and, and in my opinion, um, the continuation of care should come from either like an RN who has that specific professional development training, whether it's an extra 
I, I was, I actually became a bereavement doula in one of my action uh, and it was a 30 hour training course. So whether it's an RN who's designated on that floor, um, I will say Bridgeport Hospital has a really great bereavement program um, that should be looked at as a, 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 a pinnacle of how to do it right. Um, they have trained staff, whether it's a social worker or an RN, to be able to explain those forms and explain what's going to happen. Um, that, but in terms of that time, it's 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 just you're reeling from what just happened, and so having that time to make that decision, um, it, 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 it's it, it's an invaluable thing for a parent. So, thank you. Does um, the Bridgeport model um, also include? Um, the, your options? Does it include all the things we spoke about? I, I'm pretty sure it does. So um, there was some pushback because Bridgeport is under the Yale Health Center um, and my situation happened at Yale. So uh, I, I had to kind of dive in between and I, I worked with an organization called Hope After Loss, which is an amazing organization that helps um, parents who are grieving uh, and support groups and stuff. And so they were able to kind of showcase to me, um, uh, they, they introduced me to a nurse and RN who runs the bereavement program. So I don't know the specifics per se, but I do know that they have a bereavement program that really um, is running very well for parents. Okay, well, um, is there anything else you wanna tell us? Um, I think I, I, I think I'm okay. I think I really just appreciate that you guys are, are circling back and, and, and hearing my story in order to be able to help other, other parents in, in, in similar situations. Well, we really appreciate you doing that and thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, Representative Daphne. So Rep Wielander, please. Hi, Katie. I just want to thank you so much for being here today and sharing your story with all of us um, and being such a fantastic advocate to try to ensure that um, what you went through doesn't happen to other families. And I really just appreciate you making yourself available in so many ways um, and your feedback on how to do this in the best possible way for, for everyone involved. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. We appreciate you. your time here today, Ms. Irwin. I appreciate it, thank you. Sure. Uh, we are now moving on to, we have Greta Wagner followed by Nicole Paquette and then Patricia Raymar. Hi Greta, are you with us today? Unfortunately, it seems that we have uh, missed Greta. We're gonna move on to Nicole Paquette, followed by Patricia Raymer and then Catherine Romero. Nicole, are you here today? I am indeed. Um, good here afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Representative Linehan, Senator Anwar, Senator Martin, Representative Dauphiné, and the distinguished members of the Committee on Children. My name is Nicole Paquette. I'm a licensed funeral director and the legislative co-chair of the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association, CFDA, which represents 220 funeral homes throughout the state. Thank you for raising House Bill 6507, an act concerning maternal choice in the event of stillbirth and the removal of delivered placentas from hospitals. CFDA supports this testimony. We submit this testimony and attached amendment in support of House Bill 6507, Section 1. And if I may, I, I would also like to just express my condolences to the speaker before me, uh, Ms. Irwin, um, for the loss of her daughter. Section 1 of the proposed bill addresses the maternal right to arrange for burial or cremation of a stillborn fetus. However, the language excludes the paternal right for same. Connecticut General Statute Section 45A-318 identifies a priority list of persons who shall have custody and control of a decedent's remains. This includes number three, the deceased person's surviving parents. The statute is listed on the back of the State of Connecticut Cremation Permit uh, and is attached with this testimony. 
the procedures and authorizations for a funeral director to arrange for burial or cremation include obtaining, completing and filing a death certificate, disposition authorizations, and securing burial and cremation permits. Fetal death certificates require much of the same information as a decedent's death certificate, except the demographic and statistical information required is that of both the mother and the father. We recognize the use of several different words that can be found in various statutes, fetus, fetal, person, decedent, and remains. Since these different words can be associated with the word died, the statutory requirements of filing a death certificate and obtaining permits, however, are procedurally the same. Therefore, CFDA asks this committee to include paternal choice to also arrange for burial or cremation of a fetus. The terms maternal and paternal could reasonably be compared to surviving parents and paternal inclusion will help to maintain consistency with the priority list of persons who shall have custody and control already in statute. In conclusion, as funeral directors, there are times when we are called upon to serve mothers, fathers, and their families for deaths occurring under a gestation period of 20 weeks. In Ms. these Car cases, a fetal death certificate is not Ms. issued. Car I'm sorry, the time allotted is up. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you wanna summarize in two or three sentences? Certainly. Uh, we simply ask that you incorporate our proposed language, uh, which is attached, just to be inclusive of these parents and their families who choose to memorialize um, and make arrangements for burial and cremation. I thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony and I'm available to you for questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Paquette. I appreciate that testimony. And quite honestly, uh, this is why we have public hearings because it is not something I thought of. Uh, so I wanna ask you a few questions. Um, typically, what happens if a child passes away, not from a stillbirth? Uh, if a child passes away and the parents disagree as to whether or not the child should be buried or cremated, is there some way to, is there some process by which you go? By, by which you go? Uh, yes, certainly representative. So the process uh, with parents disagreeing on disposition, um, ultimately a funeral home wouldn't proceed with taking either the mother or the father's um, instructions and we would refer them to probate court and one of the parents would have to be ap appointed as a custodian of the deceased remains and then with that court document from whomever a parent is appointed by the probate judge the funeral home can then proceed with the disposition. So but essentially this could be something a little different um, because we are possibly talking about a fetus rather than um, you know, a full child, right? A child of five years old, as opposed to a fetus, there's definitely um, some differences there. So I recognize, and I'm just thinking out loud, so forgive me, but I recognize that, um, that it sounds like it should be the same um, but then if we're talking about uh, what if the father isn't in the picture, what happens then in a, in a case now of um, an older child? Mm -hmm. um, the father would still uh, share that next of right kinship, regardless if he's uh, not part of the child's life. It, it, it makes no matter, he still has a right of uh, disposition as equal to the mother. But they don't have to necessarily as, um, exercise that right. So for instance, if a child passes away um, and um, the mother is not in touch with the father, then the mother then, because she's there at that time, she, does she sign something to say that the father is not in this child's life? or does, does it require that she goes to probate with um, uh, 
who actually have that father taken off the birth certificate? Mm -hmm. um, well, all reasonable and prudent attempts would be needed to locate the father um, and certainly still in these situations so that if the father were to appear, you know, in weeks or months or years later, um, really the, the, what it's still recommended would be to go to probate court um, and for the mother to uh, speak to the judge um, about um, the status of the father, you know, whatever that may, may be, so that the probate judge can uh, determine what's appropriate and, and assign her the uh, custodianship. Thank you. I, you know, um, this is part of the issue that we hadn't thought of until your testimony. And so it's going to take some time for us to work it out. I do want to say, though, um, that I'm a little hesitant, and I have to look into it deeper. And I just want to be very upfront. Um, so, are you? Do you work? I assume you work very closely with Mr. Dan Ford. Correct. So, uh, he is a personal friend. Um, so I will reach out to him and and ask for his side as well. Um, and maybe he can walk me through it a little bit more. Um, but, you know, as um, a legislator who is um, who truly believes in choice, but also believes in the fact that um, I, I know that fathers should have a say in some of that at some certain point, we just have to make sure that we're um, legislating this appropriately while still not causing families more unnecessary pain. Through the process. So those are the things I'm going to be looking for. I and mean, then I will certainly um, start asking around and gathering more information. So I thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Wielander. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Pickett, for being here. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to just follow up on the, the question about the, the paternal aspect of it. What is the language that you're recommending? Um, how would that be applied to families where there is not a father? If we're talking about um, in vitro fertilization, we're talking that the this is a same-sex couple that um, the father is not there. What is are we trying to legislate that type of of access to a the child, the body of the child? Well, what um, we've submitted an amendment um, to the raised bill, and mm -hmm. we've um, included that um, the father that's listed on the certificate of death. So that's one way that um, that could be resolved. Um, but we, you know, aside from fetal death, we are subject to to that even with um, you know people who live many years and then pass away. Um, so it's not really any different than uh, preparing a fetal death certificate. Whether so they're in vitro or even for people who are legally adopted and they bear a, a different parent name because they're legally adopted. So it would only apply to the name that was listed under the Co the co-parent line on a death certificate, mother or father or parent or guardian, is that? The, uh, the amendment that we submitted um, for the committee, um, it states that the, it's the, fa the father's name, it's, it's, it's the father's name on the certificate of death. So, you know, it, it could be the mother providing that information. It's, okay. you know, I there has I... to be an informant, but that's okay. that fetal um, certificate of death. It, it doesn't just include the mother's information. It asks for the father's information. And this is information. This is name, social security number, date of birth, birthplace, race and ethnicity, the occupation, and it asks, in addition to that, for the mother only, her residence. So that fetal death certificate is asking quite a bit of information about the father, but yet the father does not have a, uh, any say 
based on this raised bill of a choice and just procedurally with what funeral directors are doing now to arrange for burial and cremation based on that um, Connecticut General Set uh, statute section 45A-318, we're following that priority list. And although we recognize the difference between using the term fetus and using the term decedent, um, but the procedure for us as funeral directors, that's <laughs> what we're just pointing out to you. Mm -hmm. I Forgive me for for not being familiar with the um, the forms that you, that you have to deal with on a um, regular basis. Am I understanding correctly that the, the death certificates for a fetal death and or a death of a child specifically list mother and father? Or they do. They do. This okay. That that is language I was not aware of. Um and I'm glad that I am aware of it now. Um okay. I think I agree with um Representative Linehan, that this definitely brings up some questions and concerns that I was not aware of before. And thank you for bringing it to our attention. Um, and I will also be looking into this um, to learn more about this and see where it goes. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I'm all set. Thank you very much, Representative. Uh, are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to call, please, Patricia Raymer, followed by Catherine Romero, followed by John Catalan. Patricia, are you with us? Seeing she couldn't stay, so moving on to Catherine Romero. Yes. Um, hi, Catherine. Catherine. Um, hi, Representative Linehan, Senator Anwar, and distinguished members of the Committee on Children. My name is Catherine Romero and I'm testifying in support of two bills on behalf of the Center for Youth Leadership at Brian McMahon High School in Norwalk and the Mayor's Youth Leadership Council at Stanford High School. Uh, you have our te testimony, so I will summarize our remarks. The first bill we support is HB 6509, an act concerning school-based mental health clinics. Most people my age are pretty resilient. We hit roadblocks in life that throw us off balance, but we bounce back some more quickly than others, but eventually we find our way back to normal. Um, but that was during the best of times when people present in our lives and resources like in-person counseling were readily available. It hasn't been the best of times for a year and people my age are hurting. Feelings love of I can conquer just about anything put before me have been replaced by depression, anxiety, and this general mood of being disconnected. Some of us experience long periods that are defined by a lack of motivation and initiative and turning inward for others. Thoughts of suicide have become all too common. And some of us have become indifferent to the pain and struggles of others. Can you imagine that? Indifferent to others. Our coping strategies need to be restored and a good number of us will need ongoing emotional support or at least know that we have access to such support. Students in Norwalk and Stanford are fortunate because they can turn to the mental health services provided by our school-based health centers, which my friends and classmates approve of overwhelmingly. If HB 6509 becomes law, other students will have access to the same crisis intervention services and individual group and family counseling during and after school. Please see our written testimonies for suggestions about setting up a mental health clinic in school. But here's one question the bill does not address. Since school-based health centers provide physical health services and mental health services, why does the bill call for mental health clinics only? Our testimony in support of HB 6511, an act requiring background checks for youth sports coaches, trainers, and instructors is similar to the testimony we delivered last week about employees of summer camps that are licensed by the state. We have just one question. We assume municipal camps and clinics hire far fewer coaches, trainers, and instructors than summer camps do, and they do so earlier in the year. Would that not allow municipal camps and clinics to conduct fingerprint checks of prospective employees? Other questions are in our test are, are in our written, written testimony. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so very much, Mr. Mero. I um, when I saw that another student 
um, from the Center for Youth Leadership at Brian McMahon was on the list. I, I, you guys are really fantastic and you are so brave to talk about um, mental health. And I, I know that there's a stigma, there should not be. I work very, very hard to end that stigma, but there is nothing uh, that I can do that's greater than having you speak about it yourself. So um, thank you so very much for your strength and your leadership. Um, I just really love your group. And I hope that at some point we can talk offline and maybe we can have a Zoom um, with the chairs of this committee um, and, and your own legislators and the entire group uh, because you guys are the um, change makers for tomorrow. And I, I see you all doing really great things. And I, I would love to just sit down and talk with you all um, and, and with that, um, you gave some really great suggestions and you had a really important question that you wanted answered. So I'm going to immediately throw it to Representative Wielander who can answer that question directly for you. Representative Wielander. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hi, Catherine or Ms. Romero, I should say. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I wanted to just make sure you're asking specifically um, about why we designated this as a mental health clinic rather than a full school-based clinic? Yes. Okay, so I can answer that. Um, I will say that in the language of the bill, there is the uh, ability for any school district that wishes to expand to be a comprehensive full um, school-based health clinic, they can go as far as they would like to based on the needs of the the school community that they identify. Um, this was something that specifically when I was putting this language together, the mental health concerns were um, something that I've been hearing directly from um, a number of different sources and wanted to address that immediate concern, um, but wanted to make sure that the language also allowed for expansion to make sure that we are getting as much um, help to our school communities as possible because I completely agree that this is a, a whole health situation um, and that the physical and mental are completely connected. And so we, um, you might see something where a, an anxiety is manifesting itself in headaches or not sleeping or stomach aches or you know, things like that. So there's, there's definitely, yeah. and, and I would love for it to be as comprehensive as possible. Um, and I'm glad that we can, I see that you also support that as well. Um, so did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Oh, um, Kit. Oh, but I also just wanted to say thank you for being here today and your suggestions as well. Um, I think what I found in the work that I've done with, um, with students on any type of of outreach program is the most successful are the ones that are actually in directly involving or led by the students themselves. Um, because I can say things until the cows come home to my son's um, you know, classmates, but if one of his peers says something, he's gonna listen to that a lot more. So I think it would be a great idea to try to integrate as much student feedback as possible um, to ensure that these types of any type of health clinic is utilized to the best of its ability and is the most effective. So thank you for those suggestions. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Representative. You're welcome. I believe I am taking over um, uh, for Representative Linehan at this point um, to chair the meeting. Does anyone else have any other questions? For Ms. Ramiro? No, see none. Um, I'm going to make sure that I say this because I know um, Representative Linehan probably would if she was here. If you can make sure that we have your email address, we can make sure to um, get you something to recognize your involvement because it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to do and we wanna make sure that the people who do take that time are, are celebrated, so thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Um, next on our list of speakers is John Catalan, uh, followed by Alexandra Bostic and Aaron Janicek. Hopefully I'm saying those names right. 
Uh, thank you, Representative. Uh, thank you, Representative Linehan and Senator Anwar, uh, Senator Martin and Representative Dauphiné, uh, for the, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is John Catalan. I'm here today on behalf of the Connecticut Alliance of YMCAs. Uh, the Alliance represents 21 YMCAs across the state of Connecticut. While we support the concept of House Bill 6511, uh, we do have some concerns, and it's the same concerns I brought up last week with the background checks on camp counselors. Uh, according to the feedback I've received, it's taking four to eight weeks for fingerprints to come back just for our child care workers. And that's a, you know, that's a generous, that's a generous date. Um, so basically, first of all, when the background check, if it was required with fingerprints, if it was required of coaches that we hire, by the time those fingerprints would come back, those results would come back, the season would be over. And obviously we would be spending uh, money on something that, you know, you, we wouldn't be accomplishing anything. Um, I would just, I would add that we are supportive of every other concept in this bill. Uh, we already do all this at the YMCA's. We even do this for our members. You you cannot become a member of the Y without having a background check. So um, you, we we do the search of the national and state sex offender list, and we do criminal conviction searches. So uh, the Connecticut Alliance of YMCA's is supportive of House Bill six five one one, but we would respectfully request uh, the fingerprinting requirement be removed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gadolin, um, for your testimony and for being so specific with your concerns. Um, I know that is appreciated. Um, I don't have any further questions on this, but I see that Representative Dauphiné does. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Catlin. Um, I did hear you a few days ago when you testified. Um, I think you may have already answered my question. So you're saying that you already do background checks, but um, you can expedite them very quickly so you don't have to wait. Is that what you're saying? Minus the back of the uh, fingerprint? Um, yeah. How, yes. How, okay, how quickly can they be done? Usually we get back the results from doing the searches on the, the uh, uh, sex offender list, the state and national, and the criminal conviction list within 48 hours. Okay, that's that's helpful. And then I think the last time you testified... You, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you testified that in all the years you've been doing this, which I don't recall how many, but it was, I think, oh, well over a decade, yep. that you only come across one instance where there may have been someone who um, had applied that would not have qualified via the background check. Is that correct? That's correct. And to be honest with you, you know, it was mentioned previously during some testimony, it was a, a minor criminal offense that was conducted. Someone was, you know, a, a, a young, you know, 18 years old, you know, it was, and unfortunately because of that, they were placed on the list. Um, and that's been the only person. And actually, you know, once we had further discussions with that person, they were allowed to be hired because it was not a, a, uh, uh, criminal offense that we, you know, the Y felt that that time would endanger any children. That's very helpful. I thank you for your testimony and for the answers to my questions. Thank you, Madam Thank you, Chair. Representative. Thank you. Uh, Senator Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, John, how are you? Hi, Senator, how are you? I'm pretty good, thank you. Hi, John, uh, YMCA, you know, you, you list the things that they do uh, for, uh, you know, the screening. What got, where did you guys get your guidelines? Uh, we, they were developed by our y, YMCA of the USA, which is our national organization based out of Chicago. Uh, one of the things that is required of all our Ys to maintain your affiliation with YUSA is you have to implement child safety protection measures. And this is a part of it. So uh, those standards were developed by YMCA of the USA. And John, when you guys, do you, does, does it, is it done internally uh, uh, regarding the, you know, the request? Uh, I guess I'm, uh, I'm right. sort of searching. Are you guys, do you guys uh, do use a third party in order to do that? Yes, yes. We, all of our wise, for the matter of hiring practices, you will use an outside firm. Um, and that, 
uh, that cost is anywhere between 15 to $25 um, to use a third party firm to do those searches. Is that something you go out to bid with every single year or is that something you've got developed a relationship after you made that selection and you, you're pretty happy with that third party? Well, so each, since we have 21 Ys, each of them use a different company depending on, you know, who they have a relationship with or who they've worked with in the past. So there, you know, there are a number of companies that supply this, this service. So that's up to each individual Y, uh, which organization they want to contract with. Oh, good. Okay. That's good to know. And lastly, do you, uh, you know, we had previous testimony from uh, Wayne Moss and uh, the National Council of Youth Sports. I'm sure you must have heard, you must have heard them. Yes. And pretty good organization, right? Yes. They, they do their homework. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, we've never worked with them because we're lucky enough to have a very prominent national organizations that develops guidelines for us. Uh, but, you know, obviously we're gonna be supportive of any group that wants to, uh, you know, protect children. And, you know, as I said, even if you want to join and become a member of the Y, your name gets searched uh, in the national and state sex abuse uh, registry. So we, we are very diligent about protecting children in the state of Connecticut. John, thank you as always for testifying and helping us out here on the committee. Thank you, Senator. Representative Dauphine, you have Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, one question, um, uh, Mr. Catalan. I, for the record, can you tell me how long you've been doing this? Uh, I've been in this position eight years. Eight years? Okay. Yeah, working for the YMCAs. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're Thanks, welcome. Madam Chair. You're welcome. Um, are there any further questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Callan, for your time. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, next, we have Alexandra Bostic and followed up by Aaron Janicek and Stephen, I'm going to not pronounce your last name correctly, Wanchik Karp. Is Alexandra, there you are. Hi, Alexandra, go ahead. Representative Wielander and distinguished members of the Committee on Children. This testimony is submitted on behalf of the Center for Children's Advocacy, a nonprofit children's rights legal organization affiliated with the Yukon School of Law. The center provides representation for underserved children in Connecticut's communities through individual representation, education and training, and systemic advocacy. My name is Alexander Bostic, and I'm a 2L at UConn Law, interning at the center this semester. I submit this testimony in support of HB 5698, an ad concerning the collection and reporting of adverse childhood experiences data. This bill is intended to require consistent and comprehensive collection and reporting of data that concerns adverse childhood experiences by the Department of Education and other relevant local and state agencies. Adverse childhood experiences have been listed as experiencing violence, abuse, or neglect, witnessing violence, growing up in a household with substance misuse or mental health issues, going through instability from parental separation or frequent moving, and living in under-resourced neighborhoods. Studies have found that a child exposed to prolonged stress can be physically affected. Stress can harm the various bodily functions, such as the nervous, endocrine, and immune systems, and it can even affect a child's DNA. Stress can also affect attention and impulse control, decision-making, and learning. If stress is not prevented or reduced, children may, among other consequences, struggle to learn or finish their education, and may have difficulty forming healthy and stable relationships. It also increases the risk that children will become involved in criminal activities and engage in risky behaviors. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention has listed adverse childhood experiences as an urgent threat, recognizing the serious impact that these experiences can have on individuals. Other states have also begun to recognize the impact that these experiences have and are having on children. For example, Illinois, in adopting a resolution to make May 15th Trauma-Informed Awareness Day, encourages policy decisions that consider adverse childhood experiences and encourages agencies to document the impacts of these experiences. Michigan has also adopted a resolution for agencies to assess if their programs reduce adverse childhood experiences, as well as provide a report and data about the progress of these experiences. The Center for Children's Advocacy works both directly and indirectly with youth who have had varying levels of adverse childhood experiences. We see the effects that these experiences have on these children each and every day. It not only affects their school attendance, their learning capabilities while in the classroom, and their capacity to deal with stress, but most importantly, their ability to live safely. 
For these reasons, the Center for Children's Advocacy supports the passage of HB 5698. Collecting data is an essential first step in becoming and being able to access to assess the goals and outcomes of our state's programs designed to assist with the after effects of such experiences. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Bostic, um, for being here and for providing that testimony. Um, may I ask just to follow up if, um, if your organization has the same privacy concerns that some of the other organizations have shared about the data collection? Um, I am uncertain um, whether the whole agency feels that way, but I can reach out with them and get back to you on that. That would be very helpful. We, I, I know that the um, introducers of the bill are actively looking for feedback uh, to make sure that it is done in the best way. I think we all want to make sure that we're getting the information needed, but are also protecting the the, ch the children and their families. Um, so, um, so they're active, like I said, they're, they're looking for feedback. So anything you can provide would be helpful. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Are there any questions from Ms. Bostick? Seeing that there aren't any, thank you so much. And uh, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. You're welcome. Next, we have um, Aaron Janicek. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yeah, you did. All right, awesome. thank you. Um, Representative Linehan, Senator Anwar, Senator Martin, and Representative Daphnes, Representative Wielander, and members of the Children's Committee. My name is Erin Patterson Janicek, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a senior director of clinical services for Child and Family Agency of Southeastern Connecticut, where I oversee the operations of 13 integrated school-based health centers in New London, Groton, Waterford, and Stonington. I'm also a board of directors member for the Connecticut Association of School-Based Health Centers, and I'm here to, uh, to speak in support of House Bill 6509. As a school-based health center mental health clinician and now administrator, I would like to share why school-based health centers are in fact the best way to expand mental health services in our state schools. School-based health centers provide barrier-free, high-quality mental health services, utilizing evidence-based models, allowing students to receive counseling without worry about transportation, lengthy wait times, or insurance coverage. Care is provided in the child's familiar environment and working parents can access important services for their child without missing valuable work time and wages. Earlier, I listened as you all talked about keeping children out of the ED for mental health crises and about assuring continuity of care. School-based health center clinicians work directly with parents, primary care providers, school administrators, teachers, and support staff, assuring therapy that is congruent with any services already in place and allowing us to move children to a higher level of care quickly and efficiently when necessary, and then back down to school-based health center care when appropriate. All of CFA's school-based health centers provide both physical and mental health services, and I do believe that this integrated model offers the best care for our youth. Research shows the inextricable link between our children's physical and mental health, particularly related to trauma, ACEs, and chronic stress. This link is especially important as we manage the health ramifications now and in the years to come caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Nurse practitioners and our school-based health centers perform risk assessments and mental health screens at routine medical appointments, helping to catch those kids who may otherwise slip through the cracks until their mental health symptoms worsen significantly. Integrated school-based health center care assures that a child referred to the nurse practitioner with a stomach ache can have physiological causes assessed with the recognition that the underlying issue may be linked to anxiety or other mental health concerns. A nurse practitioner having the capacity to warmly hand off a child to a trusted mental health clinician whose face is already friendly and familiar to the child from around the school building is a hallmark of school-based health center care. We also know that these systems working together have decades of evidence on improving health-related pediatric outcomes. Lastly, as mental health screening increases um, across primary care, the school-based health center integrated model um, assures a timely and cohesive response to students in need. I ask that you support the growth of school-based health care in Connecticut until we have these efficient, integrated, and cost-effective services in every school building in the state. Thanks for your time and consideration. Thank you so much uh, for laying out such a um, a compelling 
argument for you know how this really affects so many, especially working families that are struggling right now, especially when we have so many um, childcare providers that are closed. That if you, you there's there's already that strain on families having access to to care. So um, I appreciate that. Um, are there any follow up questions? Oh, Representative Comey. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. And thanks for all your work um, helping helping our kids. Um, the um, you discussed the the collaboration um, with the community, with the stakeholders, and stuff like that, which I think is um, really important to highlight. Um, how do you work? Um, so. I'm asking you this question because you have a, you're you're in with a lot of a lot of programs, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, how do you work between schools? So, for instance, you know, a family may have several kids in several different schools, and um, how are you able to? Um, is that ever something that you can you know highlight as far as identifying? Some, some issues when they get into to family issues and things like that and how you guys can work together between schools. Yeah, for sure. So I know, I mean, the ideal is always that you have sort of one, one organization running your school-based health centers across one district, right? Because so we're in, um, you know, almost all the buildings in New London and that allows us to basically serve uh, with ease because if a school, if a child moves from one school to the other, or if there's one child at one magnet school, another at another, um, we can really work with the entire family system and they can each have their own sort of supportive services. And then we, we have a really good sense of what's happening in the family. So then it's much easier for us to do family work. So obviously it's why we pitch um, that we, we would love one of these everywhere. Um, and also for us, the way that it works with registration is when you registered for school-based, your parents have signed you up you're registered. So what you move to the next school, you're still registered. Um, we have that record, we're able to serve you, you know, unless your parent pulls back registration. Um, but so the kids never get lost in the system in that sense. They're always known to us, no matter which school they move to. So it's super helpful for sure. That's fantastic. Thank you. Of course. Are there any other questions? Seeing them, thank you so much for your time for this important conversation. I really appreciate it. And I know the rest of the committee does as well. Yes, thank you so much. And I hope you couldn't hear my kids yelling too loud in the background. It's family, mine are in the background too. We're, <laughs> this you. is the life. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, next and last on the, the list, um, and as my principal says at our school, last but not least, um, we have Stephen Wanchik Karp. Um, is he here? Thank you very much. Um, you know, they always say, if you can't be first, then it's best to be last. So we're here today. Uh, my name is Stephen Weinstein Karp. I'm executive director for National Association of Social Workers, Connecticut chapter. We represent over 2,300 members. I'm here today to testify in favor of 6509 and to talk very briefly about the importance of school-based health clinics. Put simply, you know, this is a committee, the Children's Committee has always been a committee that's looked at data and wants to really see, are things really working? School-based health clinics work, period. If we're gonna put money into healthcare, this is a place to put it. First of all, it brings access to children. Many times children's parents are working, many times multiple jobs. There may be parents that have some stigma and concerns about mental health. There's lack of accessibility and there's long waiting list in many communities. So these obstacles are really removed by putting mental health services into a school. School-based health clinics um, typically have 50 or more percent of the children are being served for mental health care. Now we do support full services, mental health and physical care, but the reality is that there are many schools that simply do not have the space to put a full clinic. To put, so at least to put a mental health clinic in place where what you really are looking for is a private room for confidential purposes really makes this much more accessible to many schools. And given the fact that there is a massive need in Connecticut for children's mental health, 
previous speakers have already spoken to that. I like to talk about the tsunami that's coming. We have a mental health tsunami. It's coming our way. Connecticut is not prepared. This tsunami is going to wash away too many children who won't be able to get an education because they simply have too many mental health issues to be able to learn. School-based health centers help children to learn how to deal with their issues, whether it's depression, anxiety, just uh, they're being bullied, they're just fearful. I mean, kids are afraid that their parents are gonna get sick and die. They're afraid that their siblings or themselves are gonna get COVID and they just assume they're gonna die. Um, children go to school, the ones who aren't remote, they go into the classroom, someone gets COVID and they close down the classroom. The child gets yo-yoed back and forth between being at home and being in school. Um, it creates tremendous issues for children, particularly younger children. School-based health center clinicians can help them learn how to address that and help them learn how to do mindfulness, to help them learn breathing exercises. And the earlier we can get into the schools, elementary schools, the better off we are because the sooner we can start treating, the better chance we have to prevent further issues down the road. Kids can be pretty resilient, but they really do need some help. And in this particular environment with this pandemic, and what we know is going to be a long lasting impact post pandemic. It is so critical that we expand mental health services. School based health centers, okay. so school based okay. health centers um, are really, in many ways, the okay. answer that we need. They're accessible, sir. They're quality care. Sir, the, the time allotted has expired. If you want to summarize in two or three sentences, sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, uh, schools don't work in a vacuum and kids come into the school with all kinds of issues that, that, that they're confronting in their lives. If they need mental health services, school-based mental health clinics would be, is really an excellent answer to make it possible for those children to be successful in, in, in the school. And in, we spend a lot of money on education. We should be spending a little bit more money on mental health services so those kids can benefit from all those dollars that we put into education. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to, a couple of things that I'm really grateful you brought up. Um, one, the the first part is the, the space and how we would love, all of us would love, I think, to make sure that no matter how it happens, our children have access to the care that they need, mental, physical, emotional, all of that. Um, but when we're specifically talking about the mental health um, school-based mental health clinics. One of those concerns is space. A number of our schools are across the state, especially even in my own district, are at bursting capacity. Um, and to try to create a massive separate space um, would be really, really difficult for them to implement. And the additional cost would be such a barrier that I would, I would fear it would not happen at all. Um, so that I wanted to bring up um, and also what you mentioned about the stigma and having something that's one of, I think one of my main goals in my own personal work and along with this bill is the, the idea of, um, of normalizing these types of conversations, making sure that we remove anything that identifies this type of care and treatment as um, something out of the ordinary, and it becomes part of our conversations of general health uh, for our children, because I agree that we are going to be facing some serious, serious um, challenges in our schools and our communities in the next, you know, as we move forward in the pandemic. Um, and also the last thing I just wanted to bring up was the, the types of, of, of treatment and um, services that can be offered that you mentioned because I don't think that had been mentioned specifically about mindfulness and just breathing exercises and things that can address a potential anxiety issue early on before it becomes something that needs a higher level of treatment. So in having that early intervention um, and, and allowing and giving agency to our students to over their own care is also something that I think is really valuable. Um, and I appreciate you bringing those, those Thank you. Can I just say a real quick comment about in terms of, you know, full clinics versus partial clinics. Um, a full clinic may be the perfect, 
situation, but we shouldn't let the perfect situation be an obstacle to a very good situation. I think that that's a great way to look at it. So thank you. Um, are there any other questions? No, seeing none. Thank you so much for your time and for the points that you brought up. Uh, we appreciate it. And I just wanna make sure, um, so I think we're all set with, with you, sir. Um, thank you for being here. And has any of the, have the, any of the other speakers from before been able to be here now? Doesn't look like it. Um, so I will just, Say thank you to everyone for being here for your time this afternoon and your involvement in the committee on behalf of our chairs and uh, and adjourn the meeting for the afternoon. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.